Unit 1, Recording 1. 1. I, I think the idea of globalization is, is, a, is a great thing. I like the sense that the world is a smaller place and that things are accessible. And I guess what I think really stands out for me is the、um, sort of sharing of ideas, really.、Um, you know, maybe we can inspire each other, learn from each other.、Um, and.、Um, Yeah, I think, yeah, create a, a sort of sense of tolerance、um, for each other. Two. Well, globalization's become a bit of a swear word for a lot of people.、Um, there are good aspects to it, I suppose, but one of the things that gets on my nerves is you go to any town in England and the high streets are all, or almost all, identical. It's the same shops. The same franchises, and there seems to be so little individuality. There's no room for individuality, and I think that's a great shame because we're missing out on the qualities you would get from local areas that s p e c i a l i z e in whatever. But there's no chance for that to flourish because of the big chains that are global, and、uh, it's a bit too bland for me. Three. Living in London, you, you just see globalisation all the time. And I think this city is a fantastic example of, of the positive side of globalisation, really, because people are so tolerant on the whole.、Uh, if you go into particularly the city of London, say, you've got people from all different countries who come to work here in the financial sector.、Um, then you go into the cafe next door, and there's all different accents. And, and it's so usual now that people don't really. Comment on it or notice it. And、um, it's only when you leave London and go to perhaps somewhere more rural that you, you realise that, that it's not the same everywhere else. And、um, although that brings some tension sometimes, I think on the whole it's just a brilliant, brilliant thing. Four. Do you know what I really love is being able to see a movie that I really want to see. And if I'm not in my own country, even if I'm abroad, I can still see it. But the only problem is that when everybody's got the same movies available and you go to America or you go to Australia and you can see the same movies roughly the same time, the only problem is that the, the local stuff, the independent movies, the small, kind of cooler movies, don't seem to figure as much. It's just g l o b a l i z a t i o n I suppose, tends to favor the, the movie makers with more money. And so, you know, some of that.、Um, Some of that low budget stuff is really exciting and really interesting, and that doesn't surface quite as much. But, you know, the plus is that if you're abroad and, and you think, oh, I really want to see that movie, you can. Five. Well, I think globalization is a good thing, actually.、Um, a few years ago, my friend and I went on a graduation trip、uh, to Japan for two weeks, and we were really excited because. We were always really into Japanese culture and food and everything. And when we got there at first, it was amazing to eat authentic Japanese food all the time. But after a week, I just really wanted something from home and very simple and not with fish in it. So、um, we ended up going to McDonald's, and that kind of became my everyday thing because I just couldn't. Stand having fish every morning for breakfast.、Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely for globalization. Six. Yeah, I must say, I think in general, it's a really good thing.、Uh, you know, with my life here, it suits me, the kind of globalization thing. But I must say, recently visited Cuba, and it, it seems that a place like that that hasn't really been affected by globalization, you know, there's very little internet and、uh, There's no American multinational companies and fast foods and things like that, and no advertising. It's just great to be there because you don't feel bombarded by all the kind of global brands that we all have to live with all the time. And as I say, although I actually like globalization in general, while I'm there, I'm just delighted that it hasn't affected the place. So it's a shame, really, there are not a few more countries that haven't kept their identity as much as Cuba has. Unit 1, Recording 
I've come to King's College London to talk to Dr Jennifer Jenkins, who's a senior lecturer in applied linguistics. Now, Jennifer, you're quite interested in the teaching and learning of international English. Can you explain in general terms what this is? It's based on the fact that nowadays the majority of people who speak English around the world are non-native speakers of English. They're, they've learnt it as a second or subsequent language. They use it to speak with each other and therefore they're not really learning what's always been called English as a foreign language. English to speak to native speakers of English, they're learning it for more international communication and that has all sorts of implications for the sorts of things that they need to be able to do. So what would be the main differences between the kind of English that's widely taught around the world today and perhaps what you describe as a more international form? Well, there'd be various differences. There'd be differences in what they need to be able to do when they're pronouncing English. There would be some differences in the grammar. There'd be some differences in uh, use or not of idioms. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that's widely taught when teaching English that would be missed out in international English? Yes, I think, for example, that there doesn't seem to be much point in teaching learners to say the th, the th and the sounds, because most of the world's learners of English, speakers of English who are non-native speakers, don't pronounce a th. Uh, and what is the thinking behind the idea of international English? Well, there are two things. One is that the more different groups of people around the world speak English, the more important it becomes to make sure that they have enough in common so that they can understand each other, that they're intelligible to each other. And here, pronunciation is very important because their pronunciation is the thing that will vary most mm -hmm. um, among different speakers of English. Um, and the second thing would be that now that English is spoken as an international language, nobody owns it anymore. The native speakers of English don't own it and so don't have the right to expect everybody else around the world when they speak English to conform to native speaker ways of speaking, that everybody has the right to develop their own ways of speaking English. So what would you say are the advantages for students and teachers of this form of English? Well, one, one advantage would be that they actually have rather less to do, rather less to learn, because instead of trying to learn the entire um, way of speaking of a native speaker, which is incredibly complicated, and most learners never do achieve this in any case, so they've got less to do, but they're also allowed to um, keep something of themselves in their English. They're speaking English as say a Japanese speaker of English or um, um, an Arabic speaker of English, a Spanish speaker of English um, and therefore they are allowed to be themselves in English. Right. And how do you see English uh, being learnt and spoken in say 30 years time? How do you feel it will have changed? Well the English that's being spoken internationally I think for example will have no longer um, say British based or American based idiomatic language because this is not useful for international communication so that will have gone. I think that um, quite probably the nouns that we call um, uncountable nouns like information and so on will have become countable nouns for international use. I expect in Britain we'll carry on talking about um, information as a piece of information but quite possibly the rest of the world will be saying three informations without treating it as an uncountable noun. I think quite likely the third person singular s in the present simple tense will have gone for international use. Um, I think in pronunciation I think the th sound will have gone and possibly the the sound as well. Most learners will say instead of th will say a s or a t, as most of them do anyway at the moment, um, but it will just be legitimate then. There must on the other hand be students who, who will want to speak English the way that they perceive it to be spoken in Britain or America. And so what would you say to them? Well, I'd say, first of all, I'd want to explain the facts to them, the fact that they are the majority, that the non-native speakers of English are the majority. And having explained that, and also the fact that they're much more able to express themselves 
who they really are, their identity in English, if they keep something of their background, of their mother tongue. I would then say that we can't patronise learners, that if learners still want to learn to speak as closely as possible to a native speaker, say of British or American English, it's their choice. And the important thing is to give learners choices so that they can make up their own mind what it is they want to do. Well, Dr Jenkins, thank you for talking to me about that. It'll be interesting to see how far things change. Unit 1, Recording 3. 1. Well, there are two things. One thing is that they're intelligible to each other. 2. The second thing would be that nobody owns English anymore. 3. One advantage would be that learners have less to do. Unit 1, Recording 4. 1. Uh, this maybe isn't uh, the most original uh, way, but uh, I think I really improved my English when I watched films and uh, TV programs with the subtitles on. Um, the subtitles help you to, of course, understand better, but you don't feel like you're really studying a language. You just feel like you are enjoying a film with uh, drama or romance or murder, and it's it's... It's just like enjoying yourself and it's not like you're learning anything. Two. I, I'll tell you what I'd say, actually, and this is something that I've done myself. Um, I went to learn Spanish in Argentina and uh, I found the thing that helped more than anything was doing a class in tango. Uh, guitar, I play guitar. Um, and, you know, you go in the class and you're not thinking about learning the language. You're thinking about the instrument or you know, whatever the class is that you decide to take. And somehow it seems to sink in a bit more. The language actually sinks in rather than if you're focusing on grammar or whatever. And just, you know, playing the chords and, and learning the vocabulary of music, uh, I found that was uh, absolutely fantastic and I'd recommend that to anyone. Three. This sounds a bit weird, but a friend of mine told me that the best way she found to learn English or to improve her English, I should say, was to try and think in English whenever she could. So when she was by herself, walking down the street or on a bus, or whatever, she'd, she'd look around and try and describe in her head what she could see. Um, then she used to also imagine conversations she might have with people in the future or imagine a conversation with a friend or something in her head. And I think sometimes when she was by herself, she used to talk out, talk out loud to herself even. So she had a whole... She was doing all this practice all the time just by herself in her free time. It sounded pretty clever to me. Four. And when I was 19, I think, I went to England to become an au pair and learn English. And um, the best thing about this was uh, if I was ironing or hoovering the house, for example, I would put um, the radio on or YouTube or something like that and listen in the background. So I have all the time the English language going into my brain without really thinking about it. I think it's best if you don't concentrate if it, if it goes on, you know, in the background. It's really helpful. Five. Well, I've always believed that uh, learning a foreign language you have to communicate constantly in that language. So I would always say, you know, get yourself a girlfriend from the country of the language you wish to learn. Six. Well, when I lived in Poland, uh, I was never very extroverted as a person. But when I first came to England, um, I realised that the only way that I would get better in English was to just talk to everybody um, so I made myself uh, have conversations with with oh, people I met on the street or um, at the bus stop or, or shopkeepers, um, even people in the cafes. Uh, some people, they weren't always very friendly, but, uh, but lots of people actually are and they're very polite, uh, especially the older people. Seven. 
You know what I do uh, to keep up my Spanish is I just go online regularly and read the news websites, all in Spanish, of course. And um, I, I choose to read about something I really am interested in anyway. Um, I just find that's that's more helpful. So I may be reading about, in my case, I love football, so I'd be reading about football or maybe business and something I'm interested in anyway. And um, it's just so much easier to read in a foreign language if you're interested in what you're reading about. And it's great for your vocab. And it sort of just reminds you about what you already know. Unit 1, Recording 5. 1. The main news today is, of course, the weather as Hurricane Georgina approaches the East Coast, forcing tens of thousands of people to evacuate the area. Businesses along the projected path of the hurricane have closed early, windows have been boarded up, and all flights into and out of the area have been suspended. The storm has also caused a sharp drop in share prices across the world as markets respond to the fear of substantial damage to the U.S. economy and disruption to trading. Analysts fear that the cleanup operation could cost over $15 billion, although this is still much less than the $100 billion in cleanup costs and damages that Hurricane Katrina cost in 2005. 2. Japanese firm Toyota has announced that it's to create 200 new jobs at its factory in Derbyshire. The factory has been manufacturing cars for over 25 years, and the cars produced there are sold all over Europe. Local people have welcomed the news, with MP Rita Perkins calling it a vote of confidence in Derbyshire and its people. On the same day as this news, however, local firm Mulkins, which manufactures cutting tools, announced that it was to close with the loss of 150 jobs. Mulkins has struggled to export its goods to foreign markets in the face of strong competition from abroad. 3. A new report into the attitudes of Australians towards climate change suggests that while the vast majority of people think climate change is happening, there is a lack of agreement about the causes. Many still refuse to accept that climate change is the result of human activity, with a third of the people questioned believing that it's part of a natural process. The other two-thirds believe big polluting nations such as the US and China are mostly responsible. Together, those two countries produce over 12,000 million tonnes of greenhouse gases a year. 4. Over the past few days, queues of people have been forming outside an old colonial building in South Mumbai. They have been queuing, believe it or not, for a coffee. Last Friday, Starbucks opened its first coffee house in India in Mumbai's historic Elphistone building. Two more coffee houses in the chain are scheduled to open this week. Starbucks already has around 20,000 branches in more than 60 countries, so in some ways, the only surprise is that it's taken them so long. Not everyone, however, is happy at the prospect of Western brands entering the Indian market, and independent retailers have been holding rallies against them. Unit 1, Recording 6 1. American English and British English. A. All flights into and out of the area. All flights into and out of the area. B. Share prices across the world. Share prices across the world. C. $15 billion. Fifteen billion dollars. Two. British English and Australian English. A. Sold all over Europe. Sold all over Europe. B. A vote of confidence. A vote of confidence. C. Announced that it was to close. Announced that it was to close. 3. Australian English and Indian English. A. The vast majority of people. The vast majority of people. B. Part of a natural process. 
part of a natural process. C. 12,000 million tons of greenhouse gases. 12,000 million tons of greenhouse gases. 4. Indian English and American English. A. Scheduled to open this week. Scheduled to open this week. B. 20,000 branches. 20,000 branches. C. Not everyone, however, is happy. Not everyone, however, is happy. Unit 2, Recording 1. 1. Desperate. Helpless. Shattered. 2. Ashamed. Relieved. 3. Envious. Mortified. 4. Disgusted. Indifferent. 5. Insecure. Overjoyed. 6. Devastated. 7. Apprehensive, disillusioned. Unit 2, recording 2. And now for Inside Track, the slot where we get to ask an industry insider about some of the secrets of their trade. Today we're talking to advertising insider Andrew Trulides about how adverts appeal to our emotions. Welcome to the programme, Andrew. Tell me, do you think most adverts appeal to our emotions? Not necessarily. Actually, I think a lot of advertising is rational. Mm, Define what you mean by rational advertising. Well, if the ad points out certain features and benefits that are superior to the competitors, then that's a rational appeal. The most obvious rational appeal is price. So if the advert says our supermarket or our brand is better value for money than the other ones, then that's a rational appeal. Or, you know, this washing powder cleans better, or this car uses less fuel. Those are all appealing to our logic. So how does that contrast with an advert that appeals to our emotions, then? Well, say if the washing powder advert shows a mother wrapping her baby in a soft towel or happy children running around in the garden getting dirty while their mother smiles and washes their clothes... That's an emotional appeal because the advert is saying if you use this washing powder, it shows that you love your children. It shows you're a good mother. Um, uh, but surely what most people prefer is straightforward facts and information. Why do advertisers feel the need to make an emotional appeal? One problem is that facts and information can be very boring. I mean, talking about the mileage and fuel consumption of a car, for example, is pretty dull. And if you take cars, small cars, say, to be honest, these days most of them are pretty much the same under the bonnet. There aren't really many differentiating factors in terms of quality. Mm. So the ad tries to bring in a sense of excitement, maybe suggest a sense of the adventures that you might have in your new car or in some other way appeal to people's aspirations. Maybe it makes them feel that other people will look up to them if they buy this particular car. It's interesting that a lot of advertising for expensive luxury cars, like, say, a BMW, is aimed at people who will never be able to afford that car. But the idea is that the people who do buy the BMW, they feel that other people will envy them for having that car. It gives them kudos, increases their credibility, makes them feel ahead of the game. So ads try to make us feel superior to other people? Um, not always. Other ads might be about fitting in with your peer group, being one of the gang. This is true of a lot of advertising for fashion or music, for gadgets like, say, phones or iPods. The message is that if you haven't got one of these, then you're left out. You're not part of the group. Mm, So basically, they're trying to make us feel good about ourselves one way or another. One way or another, yes. You know, going back to that supermarket or food brand... Some adverts basically say, we're not the cheapest, we're a luxury, but you deserve a luxury, you deserve to pamper yourself. So you see someone sitting with their feet up enjoying the chocolate, or lying by the pool of a luxury hotel eating the ice cream. There was one brand of beer a few years ago whose slogan was reassuringly expensive, Mm. and the message there is, treat yourself, 
you're worth the best. And this obviously means the company can charge more for the product. Yes, that's how you create a valuable brand. People feel they are paying for a particular benefit, whether it's a particular brand of T-shirt that makes them feel cool or whatever. And do ads ever appeal to negative emotions? Do they ever try to upset people or deliberately annoy them? They would never deliberately set out to annoy people, but some ads definitely set out to shock people, especially、um, things like public health campaigns. The anti-smoking campaigns we've had in this country are probably the best example of that. It's often charity ads which appeal to negative emotions. Funnily enough, you know, shock people or make them feel guilty, and that's just a numbers game, really. With a certain percentage of people, that will work, and they will donate to the charity. Does that sort of thing ever backfire? Yes, it can backfire if you use the wrong tone of voice. People don't like being shouted or lectured at in ads. So if charities or health campaigns do that, they can really turn people off. But surely advertisers must test their ads to check they have the right effect. Oh, absolutely! All ads are pre-tested with focus groups to monitor people's emotional responses and make sure they have the kind of effect that's intended. You know, how did that particular word make you feel? How do you feel when you see that image? That kind of thing. These days, advertising companies often set up discussion groups online and check responses in different countries. Something like the Nike slogan "Just Do It" that will have been tested all over the world to check that it has the right emotional effect on people in different places.、Mm. And are there any restrictions on the kind of appeal you can make to people's emotions? Do the government have any rules about this sort of thing、uh, for products that might be considered bad for people, for example? <laughs> oh yes, in most countries, things like beer advertisements, for example, are very heavily regulated. So you can't show people under twenty-five in them, for example. But you also can't appeal to certain emotions. You can't show too much enjoyment, sexual achievement, etc., etc. You can't make the ad too funny. It can be a bit funny, but not too funny. <laughs> Interesting. That's something we haven't really talked about. Lots of ads seem to appeal to our sense of humour. How does that work? Well, I think it's often the case that the advertisers simply feel they should entertain people. You know, if they're taking up their time in the breaks between TV programmes. But there can be a bit more to it than that. It's interesting that a lot of ads for online gaming and betting use humour. The message there is basically, okay, we all know that betting is a bit silly and not very good for you, but hey, it's fun, and you're the kind of person who likes a bit of fun. <laughs> so once again, in a sense, it's subtly flattering people's self-image. Pretty much, yeah. Well, we've run out of time, sadly, Andrew. But thanks very much. That was fascinating. And now the news and weather. We go over today to. Unit two, recording three, one. What most people prefer is straightforward facts. Two. It's often charity ads that appeal to negative emotions. Unit two, recording four, story A. This story is called "The Telltale Heart." And it's a short story written by the American writer Edgar Allan Poe in the 1840s, so a long time ago. But it's quite a famous story in American literature, and there have been a couple of films based on it too. It's a very short, quite simple story in a way, and it's told in the first person. The narrator starts by claiming that he is not in the slightest bit insane, even though he has murdered someone. Which, of course, is instantly disturbing. So, right from the beginning, you have a strong sense of unease. The narrator tells us that he has murdered an old man, not because he hated him or because he wanted his money, but because he couldn't bear the old man's evil blue eye. You never really find out what his relationship is with the old man, but you get the impression that he lives with him, maybe as a servant or something like that. Again, he insists that he is not insane, and as evidence of that, he describes the calm, cold-blooded way in which he planned the murder. He describes how every day for seven days he put his head round the old man's bedroom door during the night and stood with a covered lantern, and then shone a thin beam of light into the man's eye at midnight. However, every night the man's eye is closed, 
so he leaves the man unharmed, holding an unlit lantern in silence while the old man is sleeping. Then, on the eighth night, the old man hears him as he enters the room and wakes up terrified. For a whole hour, the narrator, the murderer, stands in the darkness in the old man's bedroom in silence, not moving a muscle. And even though there isn't a single sound, you know that the old man knows that someone is there and that he has a strong sense of foreboding. And the tension builds up and builds up. The narrator can hear the old man's heart beating louder and faster, and at that point he finally shines the light into the man's eye, which this time is wide open. The old man screams because he knows his life is about to end, and at this point the narrator moves quickly and murders him, smothers him presumably. It's a bit ambiguous in the story. And all the time, the narrator is reassuring the reader that he is completely sane, and as proof, he describes how cleverly he hid the body, how he lifted up the floorboards and hid the body under there, then nailed them back down and cleared away all the mess. But anyway, someone has heard the old man's scream, because the police come round to interview the narrator, and he takes them into the room where the old man died, and they sit in chairs just above where the body is hidden, and the police interview him. But he tells them that the old man has gone away to stay in the country for a while, and according to him, the narrator, he is so calm and pleasant that the policemen don't suspect him at all. Except that... As the conversation goes on, the narrator starts to hear a sound, and the sound gets louder and louder, and he is convinced that it is the sound of the old man's heart beating, coming up from beneath the floorboards, and it's getting more and more deafening, and he can't understand why the policeman can't hear it too. Anyway, I won't give away the ending, but it's a very, very chilling story. Not one that you would want to read when you are alone late at night. Story B One of my favourite stories is Les Miserables. I've seen the film and the musical several times, and I'm always in floods of tears by the end because it's so tragic and so moving. It's based on the book by the French writer Victor Hugo, which I must admit I haven't actually read because it's extremely long. Anyway, it's set in France at the beginning of the 19th century, and it concerns the situation of the poor, and particularly the way the criminal justice system treats them. It's a very long story, with several subplots which are too complicated to go into, but the main thread of the plot concerns an ex-convict called Valjean, and the story opens as he is released from prison after serving 19 years for stealing a loaf of bread. In prison, he has been mistreated by a law enforcement officer called Javert, who appears and reappears throughout the story, pursuing him wherever he goes. Valjean is taken in by a kindly local bishop, and despite the fact that Valjean steals from him, the bishop treats him with trust, gives him some silver, and makes him promise to reform. Thanks to this kindness, Valjean rises to become a factory owner and the mayor of a local town. However, he changes his identity in order to hide his criminal past. Meanwhile, a fallen woman called Fontine comes to work at Valjean's factory. She has an illegitimate daughter called Cosette, who she can't afford to look after and has to send away to live with a family who treat the little girl like a slave. To make matters worse, Fantine loses her job at the factory and when she defends herself against a man who attacks her, she is arrested by the law enforcement officer Javert. Eventually, she dies heartbroken. Javert also recognises Valjean, who he wants to arrest for assuming a false identity. But Valjean escapes and goes off to rescue Fontaine's daughter, Cosette. So Valjean adopts Cosette as his daughter and they move to Paris. There, the now grown-up Cosette falls in love with a wealthy law student called Marius, who is part of a radical group campaigning for democracy and justice for the poor. There are many more complicated subplots and Javert continues to pursue Valjean, 
But anyway, the story culminates in an uprising against the government, which ends in failure and in the death of many brave young men who have been fighting for justice. In the course of all this, Valjean saves Javert's life. However, Javert, in turmoil over his failure to capture Valjean and Valjean's compassion towards him, commits suicide. During the uprising, Valjean also saves Marius, who, once recovered, marries Cosette. However, all is not well, as Valjean, after admitting his criminal past to Marius, goes into hiding from the law, leaving Cosette in distress. Eventually, Marius realises that Valjean saved his life, so he takes Cosette to see the dying Valjean, and they are finally reunited on his deathbed, where the story ends. The whole story just fills you with this huge sense of injustice and despair at the way poor people just cannot escape their past or fight the system, which is completely against them. Certain moments in the story, like Fontaine's death, are just heartbreaking. But at the same time, certain parts of it are very uplifting, like when the bishop helps Valjean at the beginning – or the idealism of the students in the uprising. The songs in the musical and film are also amazing, and the story never fails to move me. Unit 3, Recording 1. 1. The answer, strangely, is priceless. The idea is that it's so valuable that you cannot put a price on it. Pricey means rather expensive for what it's really worth, and worthless means it's worth nothing. Worthwhile is not related to money. It means worth spending your time on. 2. Tight, or tight-fisted, penny-pinching and stingy are colloquial phrases used to describe someone who doesn't like spending money. Flashy, or flash, means more or less the opposite. It describes someone or something that is expensive but vulgar, in bad taste. 3. If you give someone in authority some money to do you a favour, this is called a bribe and is of course illegal. An advance is when you get given some of your salary money before payday. It is also used in publishing. Authors often receive advances before their books are published. A deposit is money you pay to someone to reserve or set aside for you something you want to buy before you pay the final amount. For example, you might pay a deposit when you book your holiday, then pay the final amount a few weeks before you go. A fee is the money that you pay to any professional person for their services, to a doctor, lawyer, etc. 4. The words that describe someone who has little or no money are skint, broke and hard up. If you are loaded, it means that you are rich or have a lot of money at the moment. All these words are colloquial. 5. The correct order from most to least positive is 1. Make a large profit 2. Be in the black 3. Break even 4. Be in the red and 5. Go bankrupt which means that your business has to shut down. 6. A waiter, hairdresser, taxi driver, etc. receives a tip from a satisfied customer. People who have retired receive a pension, either from their company or from the government. Children receive pocket money, usually from their parents. A kidnapper asks for or receives a ransom, normally from the family of their victim, and an ex-spouse receives alimony or maintenance, typically an ex-wife from her ex-husband. 7. High unemployment, a large government deficit, businesses going bust and government spending cuts are normally associated with an economic recession. High share prices, high property prices, high salaries and increase in GDP, gross domestic product and economic expansion are all associated with an economic boom. Unit 3 Recording 2 The story of Stella Liebeck is often quoted as a symbol of what has come to be known as compensation culture in the USA today. Listen to the facts and make up your own mind. 
One morning in February 1992, Stella Liebeck, a 79-year-old woman from Santa Fe, New Mexico, drove 60 miles with her son Jim and her grandson Chris to Albuquerque Airport in order for Jim to catch an early flight. After she dropped Jim off, she and her grandson stopped at a burger restaurant for breakfast. Her grandson, who was driving the car, parked so that Stella could add cream and sugar to her coffee. She put the cup between her knees and tried to pull the lid off. As she tugged at the lid, the cup tipped over and scalding coffee poured onto her lap. She screamed, and a horrified Chris rushed to help her. Stella received burns over 16% of her body and was hospitalized for eight days. Her daughter stayed home for three weeks to look after Stella following her release from hospital. Treatment for her burns, including skin grafts, lasted for more than two years. Eventually, Mrs. Liebeck wrote to the burger company asking if they would consider selling their coffee at a lower temperature and to refund her medical expenses, about $2,000 plus the lost wages of her daughter who stayed home to care for her. The company offered her just $800. Only then did Stella consult a lawyer, who advised her to sue the company. The jury awarded her $160,000 in actual damages, and an extra $2.7 million in punitive damages against the fast food restaurant in question. The sum was eventually reduced to $640,000, but not before there was a huge outcry in the U.S. media, and Stella Liebich had unwillingly become a national celebrity. Unit 3, Recording 3 Okay, so what's your, what's your take on this Stella Liebich thing then? Well, I think she was entitled to some compensation. Would you <laughs> some compensation? What do you mean yeah. by some compensation? I mean, well, I mean, let's let's be blunt about this. She burdened herself. She had to undergo medical treatment. Her her family member had to take time off of work. What I find really interesting is when you just said that she burned herself. Now, not once did she admit that it was her fault. You've just said she burned herself, and that's exactly what I think. She burned herself. So she shouldn't get any compensation from there. Yeah, but David, the coffee was absolutely ridiculously hot. It's one thing for a company to serve hot coffee, but it was 180 to 190 Co degrees. Companies would not serve coffee that hot if the public didn't demand in the first place that they got really hot coffee. The, do it the other way around. You probably get people suing them for having cold coffee and yes, their tooth yeah. fell out. Of them. I mean, it's you know, ridiculous. But the coffee that you have at home isn't that hot, and people say, oh, coffee's great, and yeah. that's the temperature that they want. It's 135 to 140. I mean, that's a significant difference you in have to the ask temperature. This, you do have to ask yourself why they have it that kind of temperature. I mean, presumably they have it that kind of temperature because people want it that kind of temperature. Well, okay. I think people want it hot, but I, you do have to realize as well that there have been approximately 700 cases of people being burned by scalded, scalding coffee. So, well, I mean, obviously restaurants and, and takeout food places have got to take this on board. They just can't sell it that There hot. may well have been 700 cases of people being burned by scalding coffee, but, but they didn't all sue, did they? I mean, she's the only one, only one who sued. No, she's, the, anyway. she's the most famous one because she got most money out of it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No way should she have give, been given that money. No way. Look, the fast food chain makes $1.3 million a day selling coffee. They could afford this. It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous to claim that just because a company makes a lot of money and they can afford to pay people compensation, they good. They, they, they should. It's... <sighs> The thing is, nowadays, what happens is that we, we have to blame someone, and the person to blame is never yourself. Never ever yourself. It's always somebody else's fault. Always. Unit 3, Recording 4. 1. Only then did Stella consult a lawyer. 2. Not once did she admit that it was her fault. 3. No way should she have been given all that money. Unit 3, Recording 5. 1. That's it! I've had enough of VJ. Not only does he never clean up, but he also expects me to make him food when he's hungry! 2. 
That's easy. It was the day I graduated from university. Never before had I felt so proud. All my family were there to cheer me on. 3. It's funny how everything changes when you have children. I've always loved my parents, but only now can I really appreciate what they did for me. 4. No way will I have finished my research degree by the end of the year. I've still got so much data to analyse before I can do anything useful with it. 5. Under no circumstances should you go into that part of town on your own, especially at night. It's just too dangerous. Unit 3, Recording 6. 1. Write down the name of something you own that is worth quite a lot. Two. Write down the name of something you own that is probably worthless. Three. Write down something difficult you have done that wasn't worth the effort. Four. Write down the name of a job that you consider to be really worthwhile. Five. Write down the name of a tourist attraction in your area that is worth the visit. Six. Write down the name of a tourist attraction in your area that isn't really worth seeing. Seven. Write down approximately how much an hour's worth of parking costs in your city centre. Eight. Write down the name of a gadget you own that has proved its worth. Nine. Write down the name of a celebrity you know who is worthy of the public attention they have received. Ten. Write down the name of something from your childhood that is worth keeping. Unit 4, Recording 1 Acupuncture Counselling. Discipline. Endurance. Hypnotherapy. Laser. Marathon. Spirituality. Vegan. Voluntary work. Unit 4, Recording 2. Hannah. So, uh, how are your New Year's resolutions going then, Hannah? Mm, well, quite positive. I've started working with a personal trainer. Wow! What made you decide to do that? <laughs> I just suddenly decided. I'm always starting going to the gym and then not keeping it up, so I decided I needed to try something new. Um, my husband was going to buy me this fancy new phone for Christmas, but then I asked him to pay for some sessions with a personal trainer instead. But you're not overweight. I don't know why you're so worried. <laughs> yeah, but I'm totally unfit. I mean, I can't even run for the bus. <laughs> and I kind of need to tone up my muscles and stuff. And is it good? Well, I've only been three times so far, but yes, it's better than I expected, actually. The trainer, Adam, is really nice and he looks at your overall fitness and tells you where you need to develop strength before you can build up your fitness more. So 
Um, for example, I stand on my feet in a bit of a funny way and so I have to do special ankle strengthening exercises to improve the way I stand. <laughs> and that will help me to be able to move better and get fitter. Sounds cool getting that kind of personalised advice, mm. but the trainer must be super fit himself. Don't you feel a bit inferior, <laughs> you know, not being very fit yourself? Uh, not really. He's very, very encouraging, and the targets he sets are quite manageable, so you don't get demotivated. And it's fun, actually. The gym normally bores me to death, but the time passes really quickly because the exercises are really varied. And you have to do them quickly, one after another, moving really quickly from one machine to the other. And you're chatting a lot of the time, so yeah, it's really good. Oh, well, good for you. Let me know how it goes. Ted. You're looking trim, Ted. Thank you very much. I've lost eight kilos, actually. That's quite a lot. Yeah. Well, I've been steadily putting on weight ever since I started this job and got stuck in an office all day. I used to play football quite a lot, and then I just stopped doing any kind of exercise. Mm, well, you've certainly lost it now. What's your secret? I feel quite envious. I got this app on my phone called Fitness Friend, and I've been using it for about a year. It's really cool, actually. You put in your weight and age and how active your lifestyle is, and then it calculates your metabolic rate and works out how many calories you need to eat to lose, gain or maintain your weight, whatever your aims are. Uh-huh. Then you put into it what you've eaten and all the activities you've done and it works out for you whether you've eaten the right amount to achieve your aim. <laughs> Sounds a bit complicated to me. No, it's not, really. You soon get into it. That's what I really like about it, actually. It's really scientific, based on calculations. You know how that sort of thing appeals to me. And you can set it to do things like remind you to go to the gym. Really? Yeah. Or it can work out how far you've run or walked or whatever and how fast you went compared to your last run. So you're kind of competing with yourself. Yeah, I really like all the calculations it can do. Let me show you this. I think this is the best thing about the app. Mm. It's really cool. Uh, give me that packet of biscuits. <laughs> Yeah. Look, you can scan the barcode of whatever you are eating. And it tells you all the nutritional information, like how much sugar and fat and how many carbohydrates and so on. So you just enter how many biscuits you ate or how many grams, etc. And it works out how many calories you had. <laughs> Amazing! Don't you ever feel tempted to cheat? Well, yeah, that's the only problem. It's easy to cheat, <laughs> but I guess you're only cheating yourself at the end of the day. I guess so. Well, I have to say I'm very impressed, but I'm not sure it would work for me. Perhaps I'm just not that scientific. Oh, well. Nicola. You ran a marathon a few years ago, didn't you, Nicola? That must have been amazing. Yeah, I did it with my friend Julie. We were raising money for cancer research. My dad had died of cancer the year before and her sister had also had it, so that was kind of what got her started. Oh, sorry to hear that. But you used to run before that, didn't you? I mean, you didn't start running from scratch. No, we'd both done a bit of running, but not that seriously. And we just got talking about it one day when we were dropping our kids off at nursery. We'd both been thinking separately about having a go at the marathon, and the more we talked about it, the more enthusiastic we got. So how did you go about training? I mean, I wouldn't even know where to start. <laughs> We found a training programme in a running magazine and basically we just followed it rigorously, religiously, for about six months. You had to run five times a week and it started short, about 20 kilometres a week, and gradually you built up to about 75 to 100 kilometres a week. That must have been incredibly gruelling. It was horrible, completely horrible. Some days I really didn't want to get out of bed and do it, but we just stuck to it, come rain or shine. I even ran 20 kilometres once with a bad stomach bug. <gasps> I can still remember it now. Oh. And did doing it with someone else make a big difference? Oh, yeah. It made all the difference in the world. On the days when you really didn't want to get up and do it, you just felt you had to, to be there for the other person. There's nothing worse than letting the other person down. And, of course, it was someone to talk to. Long runs can be pretty boring. We just chatted for hours and hours. We got to know each other really well. But, yeah, more than anything, I suppose, it was just that you feel obliged to keep the other person motivated, and that keeps you motivated too. That and the thought of all the money you were raising. Yeah. 
The charity we signed up with was really helpful too. They had support meetings and they had a physiotherapist you could consult and all that sort of thing. So I guess you felt you couldn't let them down either. Exactly. And once we had done it, it was amazing. We were even in the newspaper. When I look back on it, it really feels like one of the achievements of my lifetime. Yeah, you must feel so proud. And you must have got so fit. Yeah, I was incredibly fit. To be honest, I've never quite managed to keep up that level of fitness since. But I'm still definitely miles fitter than I was before. And I still run four or five times a week. And still with Julie. Wow, good for you. I don't think I could ever do that. But I'm full of admiration for you and Julie. Unit 4, Recording 3. 1. This is the best thing about the app. 2. The more we talked about it, the more enthusiastic we got. 3. There's nothing worse than letting the other person down. Unit 4, Recording 4. A. Child psychologist Camilla Batmangelich, whose family came to Britain from Iran in the 1970s, had had a dream ever since her own difficult childhood to open a drop-in centre where underprivileged children from troubled homes could take refuge when they were not at school. When she finally found the premises that she had been looking for, she was warned that the centre would be overrun by local teenage gangs, many of whom carried knives and even guns. Rather than trying to keep these wild teenagers out, Camilla made a highly courageous decision to open her doors to them too. But experience convinced her that they would never respond to the authority of middle-class social workers, so again she made a very unusual decision to recruit as care workers young men who were themselves ex-gangsters and drug dealers, to whom these youngsters would be better able to relate. No child is born a criminal, believes Camilla. Thirteen years later, Camilla's charity, Kids Company, looks after 17,000 vulnerable young people in London and feeds 2,000 children who are starving because for one reason or another their parents are unable to feed them. E. 14-year-old Jack Slater was still wearing his school uniform when he leapt in to help security guards who were being attacked by a group of men in his local shopping mall. The fight had broken out after the group of four men were asked by the security guards to leave the shopping centre because they were causing trouble. Jack, whose bravery was captured on CCTV, had gone to the shopping centre with a friend after school. Dozens of adults gathered to watch the fight, but only Jack moved in to help. He saw one of the security guards being pinned to the ground and jumped on the back of his assailant and pulled him away. The police later arrived and arrested all four of the men. Jack was tracked down from the CCTV footage and presented with a £50 shopping voucher by the shopping mall to thank him for his actions. C. On the 27th of May, Lucy Gale, a taxi driver from West Yorkshire, came across a collision on a level crossing between two cars. When she arrived at the scene, both vehicles were on the line. An elderly woman driver was lying across the steering wheel of one car and the other driver was frantically trying to get out of his vehicle. Lucy looked round and saw that a train was approaching. She crossed the line on foot, dragged the woman from the vehicle and took her to a place of safety. Having made sure the woman was safe, Lucy went back to the car and, after a struggle with the seat, managed to drive it off the crossing just as the train passed. She then went to the other car and forced the other driver's damaged door open in order to let him out. Her actions stopped the train from derailing and, in all probability, prevented a serious rail accident. D. He received burn injuries on his face, back and arms, is still recuperating and lost one year of school. But ask him, would he put his life in danger once again if caught in a similar situation? Every time, Om Prakash says. The boy the son of an Uttar Pradesh farmer, pulled several of his friends alive out of a burning van, caring little about his own safety. On the 4th of September, Om Prakash was going to school along with other students in a Maruti van. But all of a sudden, the van caught fire because of a short circuit. The driver immediately opened his door and fled. 
But Om Prakash broke open the van door and pulled out the others, ignoring the flames that had spread to his face, back and arms. He rescued eight children. E. When Martine Wright lost both her legs in a bomb attack in London, it seemed as if her life had come to an end. She lost 80% of the blood in her body and spent 10 days in a coma. However, Martine was determined to fight her way back. She had to learn to walk again, and as part of her rehabilitation, she started playing wheelchair tennis and then switched to sitting volleyball. Since then, she has managed to gain a place in the British Paralympic sitting volleyball team and competed in the London Paralympic Games. Martine, who has also got married, had a child, and done a parachute jump since she lost her legs, says that her experiences have made her determined to grab every opportunity that comes her way. Unit 5, Recording 1. 1. So, something that really annoys me, and this is especially with people that you first meet, is when they start talking to you about the weather. I mean, I know what the weather's like. I can see it. I can check it myself. We don't need to talk about it. I just don't see how that is really relevant to a conversation that I would have with the person I just met. I, I don't understand. Two. Uh, I have to say, the thing that really annoys me more than anything else, and it might be because I'm getting a little bit older now, is when you get one of these young people on a bus with headphones in and it's turned up too loud. I mean, it drives me mad. If, if we can have headphones, it's for your own personal use. We don't all want to hear it on the rest of the bus. Thank you very much. Turn it down. Three. It really bugs me when people are late when you arrange to meet them and then they're just 10 minutes late or 15 minutes late and quite often they text to say, just just running a bit late. But and presumably before phones, people just got there on time, but I don't see what difference it makes. And, you know, I've normally rushed to get there because I hate being late. And then time after time, a so-called friend just leaves me stranded. I, I, oh, it annoys me so much. Four. So two days ago, I met with my friends and we're all sitting at a coffee shop and they all start taking out their phones and checking their emails and checking to see who called them and texting back. And literally, I sat there for 15 minutes just watching them text on their phones and email on their phones. And it's, it's infuriating. You might as well just not meet with your friends. Just text them instead. Five. At the risk of sounding like a grumpy old woman, which I am, um, I, I really have a problem when I see people snogging in public. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know, it, I actually have a physical reaction to it. Um, it really bothers me. And I have been known to actually object. And there's a part of me that thinks, oh, my God, you're just so, you know, stuffy and, and, and repressed. But I just, I just think it's really inappropriate when, when people are uh, kissing in, in public and, and kind of being really intimate. I, I just, I can't bear it. Really can't bear it. Unit 5, recording 2. Rosemary, what are the most common situations where people have problems in communicating? Well, probably one of the main situations where people have problems communicating is where they're unsure of who they're talking to. So, for instance, going to a party and it's a room full of strangers, people you've never, ever met before. That generally, for most people, will prove to be a little bit of a difficult situation. Um, I suppose the second area is where people are unsure of what they're talking about. So the content worries them for whatever reason. And the third area is where we're in a situation of speaking to an audience who we perceive are very different to us. So they are different in terms of their age, or their experience or their status. So that's quite general. So why don't we, can we think of a specific example? Maybe that party again. Well, let's suppose you're um, introduced to someone, again, a total stranger, you've never met them before, and you don't know them, um, you are introduced to them, and you, from the introduction, you gather that they're actually quite an important person, they're quite high status, they're very experienced, they're much older than you, and all of a sudden we think, my goodness, why would they possibly want to listen to me? And we feel totally lacking confidence. Um, 
In that situation, what are, the, what are the most common mistakes they're going to make? Well, probably one of the most common mistakes would be they would want to speak too much. They'd say too much. Uh, all this information would come out of their mouths. Uh, but what they really should be doing in that situation is asking some questions to get the other person talking to them. Not too many questions, because if we ask too many questions, it sounds like an interrogation. But getting the balance right between giving some information, but also asking for information as well through questioning. Probably one of the other things they would do tied into that, would, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't pause enough, they wouldn't um, stop to allow the other person to reflect on what they've said and to give them time to think about what they're going to say next and to reflect on what's been said to them. So that would be something they need to be careful of and to always remember that when we do pause, when we communicate, it will seem a lot of, uh, seem a quite a length of time to us, but it won't to the person we're speaking to. And what about eye contact? Well, if we don't look at someone, they immediately think that they can't trust us or we're not telling the truth. So eye contact is very important. We've got to make sure we get it right. If we give too much, they could perceive that we, uh, we rather like them a little bit too much or maybe we're being a little aggressive towards them. So we've got to get the eye contact about right. About three seconds in general is about right before we move away from the face and then come back to the eyes. A situation I often find I have trouble with is when I need to complain about something. What sort of mistakes might I be making? Well, I think it's very common to feel uncomfortable about making a complaint. Probably one of the most common things that people do in that situation is they're tempted to say far too much. So they, they uh, beca become very unclear about the nature of the complaint. They, they're not precise enough. They may well be tempted to speak far too quickly as well because actually we want to get to the end of the complaint because we don't particularly like complaining in the first place. We may also fall into the trap of not listening enough to what the other person has said because actually we may be coming, becoming emotional too and therefore we listen less actively to what the person's saying to us. Uh, and they in turn may not listen very well to us either. So the whole um, uh, complaint may become totally out of hand and we may end up completely falling out with one another. So that's probably why complaints can be very difficult to, uh, to handle. So those are the problems you might encounter when you're complaining. How do you make a successful complaint? Well, the first thing to do is to think and plan how you're going to voice your concerns. So don't go straight into it. You've really got to think and consider what needs to be said. Make sure the sentences are short. Take out any language which could be seen as being emotional and irritating to the other party. And then wait and be prepared to get a response from the other person who you've made the complaint to and really listen actively to what they're saying and summarise or test your understanding of what they've said to make sure you totally understand their point of view. And when you summarise something, how, how do you do that effectively? Well, if you think of summarising as being simply restating in a more compact form what the other person has said to you so that you've included all the key things and um, make sure that you've understood exactly what they're saying to you. So we're restating in a compact form what's been said to us. How would you summarise why good communication is so important? Because in whatever situation we're in, we always have to deal with people and we have to communicate with people. And if we're going to get the best out of people and build relationships successfully, whether it be at work or in a social situation, we need to have good communication skills. And we mustn't think that good communication skills are something that we all naturally have. It's something that we all need to work on to make sure that we build good relationships. Unit 5, Recording 3. A. Karen, hi. Are you in the middle of something? Sort of. Well, shall I come back later? Uh, no, no, it's all right. What can I do for you? Sorry to disturb you. I'm having a lot of trouble with my computer. Every time I try to print something, I just get an error message. Have you tried just turning it off and starting again? Yes. Well, it just seems to keep on happening. I thought if you had a minute, you might come and look at it for me. 
You did say if there was anything... And you've tried restarting it? Yeah, I've done that. Same thing. It just keeps freezing when I try to print. Okay, well, I've just got to finish this, if you'll just bear with me for a minute. Right. Okay, just let me send this off, and I'll be right with you. Thanks. Sorry to be a nuisance. <laughs> no, that's all right. B. Neil? Hmm? Do you fancy a walk? What? You want to go for a walk? Now? No, I thought you might, you know, a bit of exercise. Do you good? No, not particularly. I'm OK here, thanks. Right. What made you say that? Nothing. No reason. Neil? Yeah? Can I ask a really, really big favour? Depends what it is. You know the dry cleaners down the road? Mm -hmm. You know it shuts at eight, doesn't it? Ah, you want me to pick up your dry cleaning? It's just a couple of things. Oh, go on, I'd be really grateful. So that's why you asked if I wanted a walk? Well, partly yes. Although I did think you looked like you wanted something to do. I see. And is there something preventing you from going? It's just that I wanted to see the end of this programme on the telly and I'm really into it now. Oh, are you? Oh, go on. I'll make you a cup of tea when you get back. Oh, all right then. Here's the ticket. There's two coats, a skirt. C. Hi. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. May I disturb you for one moment? We have a small problem here, and I wonder if you might be able to help me. What's the problem exactly? As you'll have seen, the flight is very full this morning, so there are no spare seats anywhere. Yeah? We have a family with three small children. Unfortunately, they're sitting separately, and obviously they would prefer to sit together. Yes, and you want me to move. Would that be at all possible? Well, I'm very comfortable here, actually. I did ask for an aisle seat. Well, we can move you to an aisle seat if you'd prefer. We would very much appreciate it if you could help us here. Well, I don't see why I should. I mean, I did ask for an aisle seat. Why don't you ask someone else? D. And as I said, there's absolutely no way we can... <laughs> Excuse me a moment. James! Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, it's just about... Right. Well, um, I'm just having dinner. Right. Listen, I'd, I'd better ring you back. Is that okay? Right. Sorry about that. I'll, uh, I'll just give him a ring back. Excuse me, sir. Yes? I must ask you not to use your mobile phone in the restaurant. Perhaps you could make your call outside, if you don't mind. Oh, I didn't realise. It is the policy of the restaurant. Some diners complain that it's disturbing for them. Fair enough, if you say so. Thank you, sir. Enjoy the rest of your meal. Unit 5, Recording 4. Are you in the middle of something? If you say so. I'll be right with you. I don't see why I should. Can I ask a really, really big favour? Oh, all right then. Oh, go on. I wonder if you might be able to help. If you'll just bear with me for a minute. I'd be really grateful. Shall I come back later? Sorry to disturb you. We would very much appreciate it. I must ask you not to use your mobile phone. Unit 6, recording 1. 1. I think the price, is, the price to go to college is just ridiculous. Um, I was lucky enough that my parents helped me out and that I got a loan, which I'll have to pay for the rest of my life. But um, 
like one of my best friends, she is an amazing student and she wanted to go to art school, but she can't because the fees are too high. And I think that putting a limit on people because of for education because of money is is completely unfair. Two. Yeah, the thing I, I just think is wrong because it, it is uh, this amount of exams that they have to study for kids when they're so young. I mean, you know, kids are kids. Kids have to play. They go to school and they work at school, presumably, and they come out and at half past three, four, they're still expected to work. And it's all, you know, to get these exams, to get in some league table and competition, competition. I just think it's bad for a child. I mean, even, in my opinion, a, a kind of early teenager, 12, 13, they need their time to experiment and play and, in, you know, enjoy life a bit. Three. Yeah, I think my issue with um, schooling for uh, young children um, in this country is the fact that they have to go to school when they're so young, when they're four and a half, which is, is really a baby. And I, I think there's something really wrong about that. Um, I certainly noticed when my daughter went to school at the age of four and a half that her behaviour changed quite radically, not for the best. Um, and also, uh, I think they need to be at home to develop their own sense of identity for as long as possible. Four. You don't have to be a genius to know that if you don't invest in the younger generation, then problems are going to come around later on when they get big. And class sizes is very important because if you have too many children in a class at the same time, the teacher has an impossible task of trying to contain them because there's simply too many of them. If you had smaller class sizes, the children would learn a lot more. Unit 6, Recording 2. 1. I actually went to theatre school um, from about the age of 10 and uh, for people who don't know, you you basically are at um, a school like anybody else, except for during the day, you'll do your academic classes um, and then you'll switch to a vocational class. So you may do an English class and then do singing and then come back after lunch and do ballet and then finish off with French, for example. So that's how it works. Um, I didn't board there. And I was there till I was 14. And I would say the, the best things about it is that you have an amazing time. If you love everything about, you know, theatre and, and acting and showbiz, then you have the time of your life. And I absolutely did. Um, there's very little bullying because bullying usually happens when people don't see eye to eye. And we all have the same um, sort of goals. And... Um, other positives were that you become incredibly mature very quickly or you're earning money for what you do. So your friends at normal schools are doing what normal kids tend to do and you'll be working professionally instead of doing a school show. You'll you'll be getting paid for yours. And, um, and I generally found that was a really good thing. It makes you grow up. On the other hand, you could criticise it um, for being perhaps too... Um, worldly wise and making you too grown up um, too quickly perhaps I know that some people felt that they lost a bit of their childhood and you know worrying about work and getting auditions there's plenty of time for that so that was one thing and I think also that some children were there that didn't really want to be there their parents wanted them to be there and that's kind of awful uh, if that was the case. And I also think that um, you can argue that in some of these schools, your education suffers a little bit because really everybody's far more interested in the singing and the drama and the dancing than they are doing their English and maths and stuff. So I think that about sums it up. Two. So, yeah, my education was quite unusual um, compared to other people, perhaps, because I went to boarding school um, and um, I actually went to boarding school from the age of eight. Um, it was a very traditional school. Um, so there were lots of rules and regulations and traditions. Um, and um, we had uh, sort of a very old-fashioned uniform. Um, 
there was a lot of um, <clears throat> it, it was um, a very very busy schedule. Uh, we had almost no free time at all. There were there were classes all through the day, um, and some afternoons there was sport or there was music. And at the weekends, we also had things like the, well, there was we had classes in the Saturday morning on Saturday morning, uh, usually sport in the afternoon. And then on Sunday, we used to have to have the uh, church service and then there'd be more music. So probably the only bit of free time, uh, long bit of free time that we ever got was on a Sunday afternoon. Um, but I, I enjoyed it, my time there. I mean, I look back on it very fondly. I made lots of um, very good friends there. And I think it helped me certainly to... Um, to become very focused on uh, goals and and that sort of thing, and to deal with busy, busy uh, schedules. So um, overall, I I have very fond memories. Unit six, recording three, one. So I went to a uh, bilingual school growing up, um, a French American school, actually. And um, when I came to the school, I was five years old, and I I didn't know how to speak French at all. Uh, my parents aren't French, and um, I'm fluent in French today, thanks to the school. So in that respect, I think a bilingual education is fantastic because children learn languages so much more easily. Um, when they're you know when they're young, and it it was wonderful because we had subjects in English and in French. Um, so there was a lot of work, but but I feel like a very I had a very well rounded education as a child. Um, also, a, a lot of my friends were from different countries. It was quite an international school, so I feel like today I have all these friends from all over the world, which is fantastic. Um, the minus side to it was that my parents are actually not French, so I was I felt a little bit given given that I was the only Polish person there uh, from a Polish American background. But other than that, um, I I'm really grateful that I got to experience uh, such an education. Two. So um, I went to several quite different ordinary schools, and I didn't fit in very well at any of them. And so when I was 11, my parents decided to try educating me at home instead and actually really thrived on it. They taught me some subjects and they set the overall pattern, but an awful lot of it was self-directed. And um, I never actually went back to school as such. I went on to um, some night classes and a sixth form college to get some qualifications eventually. But um, what I really learned on my own, I mean, it was great being able to dive into the subjects that really interested me and not having to just do them to the official level. But what I really learned was how to how to learn, how to make myself teach myself. And that's actually been incredibly valuable. Um, I'm, as I work in a technology job, which is changing all the time, I'm actually still using that ability long after all the actual subject matter. It doesn't matter that much. Um, so for me, I think it was great. But I did meet some people through it who was a bit aimless I think um, as for things that could have been a bit better I had plenty of friends because I'd been to various different schools but I didn't really meet people outside my circle of friends so when I went to university things were adjusting to a much bigger more complicated social environment and starting to go out and things was actually really hard I got into it but it cost me a year of being a bit disoriented um, but all in all it was really good for me but it's very different to what anyone else I've ever met has been through <laughs> Unit 6, Recording 4. 1. I need to talk to you. Don't rush off. <laughs> 2. You're walking far too fast for me. Can't you slow down? <laughs> 3. I'm not waiting any longer. I'm sick of hanging around. Four.
Four. Can you put your hands up, please? Don't shout out. Five. We need to get moving, guys. Eat up. Six. Those two seem to be getting on well. Look, they're chatting away. Seven. Have you finished with that? Can you put it back? Eight. OK, everyone, get out your pens. Write this down. Unit 6, Recording 5 There are times in life when it comes in handy to know a little bit about what to do in an emergency. Say the guy in front of you collapses, what do you do? First of all, you need to check him over. If he isn't breathing, is unresponsive or is <gasps> breathing <gasps> like this, <gasps> it's time to do something. First priority, call an ambulance. The sooner you call, the sooner they can be there with the specialist equipment that could save his life. Then it's time to do some emergency resuscitation. Don't attempt mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation unless you are properly trained. No need for kissing. Just go for hands only or CPR. To do this, you need to put the heel of your hand on the centre of his breastbone. Yep, right where a pendant necklace would hang. Then you need to clasp your hands together like this and press straight down to a depth of about four to six centimetres. Now work hard and fast. Use your full body weight and aim to press down about twice a second. Don't worry that you might hurt him. A cracked rib is nothing much to worry about. And whatever you do, don't stop. Keep going until the ambulance arrives. If you want to know more about coming in handy in an emergency, then visit our website at www.nationalheartcampaign.co.uk Unit 7, Recording 1 1 Well, this lady looks quite extravagant, um, in a fun way, I think, and in an unconventional way. Um, there's also something quite provocative, actually, about the way she's, she's looking, um, she's looking out at the camera. I think, I think she should wear a little bit less makeup and a little bit less jewelry. Um, but other than that, I think it's, it's, it's quite fun what she's wearing. Two. To be honest with you... I really love uh, this kind of, you know, modern architecture. Um, I mean, I like some of the old stuff as well, but but for me, something, if you look at that, I mean, it's just so sleek, isn't it? It's just like, just arrived from out of space. Just love the design and the way there's a curve on one side and a, a you know, minimal flat kind of wall on the other side. Just think it's just one, I think they'll be there, you know, for future generations and they, they can absolutely love these kind of buildings. Three. Yes, I'm looking at a picture of a very attractive uh, woman wearing a really, really frumpy suit, which does nothing for her whatsoever. Um, the colour doesn't suit her, sort of sky blue. The jacket is a sort of boxy shape, which has no shape, so you can't really see her figure. And she's wearing white stilettos, which, well, well you know, I was always raised to... To, to believe that white stilettos were a bit tacky, really. So um, I think she's going for something sophisticated, but I don't actually think um, it works in this instance. Um, so I think she would look better in something entirely different. In fact, it makes her look older than she probably is. Four. Well, I love him, but this picture is not the best that I've seen of him. It's not um, not the usual clean-cut image that I expect. In fact, he looks rather scruffy in it, which yeah, doesn't work for me at all. I'm not into messy looks. I like something 
bit more refined and sophisticated and elegant. Five. Well, it's abstract.、Uh, it's an oil painting, heavy use of oils with broad, brash,、uh, brush strokes. It's、uh, not to my taste, to say the least,、um, but it would probably fetch an exorbitant amount of money. But it is、uh, very garish and、um, looks like the work of a five-year-old. Six. I absolutely love this design. I think it's a real classic,、um, and、uh, it's so fantastic to see them come back in a way, especially as they're often digital radios. But they look just like the ones,、uh, the vintage ones that my、uh, my grandma used to have when I was little. I remember. So yeah, I'm a real fan. I think it really, really works. Seven. Oh, I see. I don't like this、um, this fashion for grown women. And this lady looks to be, you know, maybe thirty something, wearing the top of a five year old with a hideous kitten on the front of it. Yeah, I just think it's a sort of twee, childish look, which、um, I should, I think, is best left for. For children, really. Unit seven, recording two. A. Some of the greatest excesses in the history of fashion, and I think most people would agree, took place in the European courts of the 18th century. First of all, there were the women's dresses. The panniers at the side of these dresses, which were kind of wire cages built underneath the skirt. Meant that one of these court ladies would take up the space of maybe three men and would have had to walk sideways through most doors.、Uh, the aristocrats who lived in these courts, who were of course only a tiny elite in society, they saw their clothes as a way of displaying their wealth. They dressed in a lavish way to show off their economic status, and of course, their clothes showed that they didn't have to work or or do anything practical. And then there were the vast powdered wigs worn by both men and women. Though I do think some of the stories told about them are, in fact, exaggerated. I don't know, for example, if many people really had mice living in their wigs, or if people really slept in a seated position because of their wigs. But the story of a wig with a model ship built into it is certainly a true one. That really did happen. What is rather strange is that when Americans and Europeans of this period traveled to Japan, they found the fashion among wealthy Japanese men for wearing their ponytail stuck to the top of their head, samurai style, very strange. They wrote about it in their diaries. It didn't seem to occur to them that their own preference for enormously tall wigs must have looked pretty weird too. B. There are a lot of contenders for this title, mostly affecting women, of course, since one recurrent feature of fashion throughout history is the way it has made women physically weaker, even disabled in extreme cases. We could say, in order perhaps to make men feel stronger and more powerful. In America and Europe, I think we would have to point to the corset worn by women for so many centuries. These frequently restricted breathing, broke ribs, and even caused miscarriages. They really could be very dangerous garments.、Uh, there was also the rather strange fashion of about a hundred years ago of wearing hobble skirts.、Uh, these skirts mimicked the styles worn by Japanese geishas, and they were so tight round the ankles that women could only walk with the tiniest steps. They apparently wore belts round their ankles to keep their steps short enough. And of course, there are similar examples in many cultures.、Uh, the neck rings worn by Padung tribeswomen from childhood, intended to lengthen their necks, which can also deform their shoulders. And of course, the tradition of binding the feet of female children to keep them small and dainty, which survived in China until the beginning of the 20th century. And I guess many of the super high-heeled shoes that we see on catwalks today fall into this category. The history of fashion is full of incredibly uncomfortable, impractical garments. In actual fact, C. I think I would point to two moments in modern history. Really, perhaps the most important one for women in many countries, at least, was at the end of the First World War. During the war, many women had been working in factories or driving carts and so forth, and they needed to wear more functional, less decorative clothes to reflect their new lifestyle. So the corsets were thrown away. 
Skirt lengths went up from the ankles to just below the knee, and long hair, which could get caught in factory machinery and so on, was cut short. Women's fashion essentially transformed from what it had been for centuries to what it is today. The other key moment, I think, was the 60s and the hippie movement. Up until that time, people had seen clothes as a reflection of their place in society. So a laborer would wear a different type of hat from a man who worked in an office, for example. But from the hippie era onwards, people began to see clothes much more as a way of expressing who they were. A way of expressing their individuality by growing their hair, wearing bright colors, or whatever they felt like. And that is something that has remained with us to a greater or lesser extent, I think. D. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm spoiled for choice here. I can think of so many. In recent years, I would probably pick out hanging pants. You know, that charming fashion for young men, or mostly young men, to wear their jeans so low that you can see their undergarments. I mean, how's that going to look in 20 years' time, really? Um, another trend I hate is wearing big glasses frames without any lenses in them. Very pretentious in my view. Uh, what else? Meggings. Leggings for men. That is not a good look in my book. Oh, and another thing I have seen on the catwalks recently, which I really don't like, is the fashion for wearing mega high heels with ankle socks. Again, I don't think we'll look back on it in 10 years' time and think, wow, that was cool. But really, there are so many examples that I could go on and on. E. It's generally reckoned that fashions make a comeback roughly every 20 years that they're usually at their most outdated about 12 to 15 years after they were originally in. As to why, I don't know if I can answer that question. I would like to say that it's usually the most elegant and classical styles that get recycled, like those of the 50s and early 60s. And we definitely do see those styles coming back again and again. But some of the ugliest fashions also make a comeback. Platform shoes, for example, which seem to come back into fashion time and again, or jumpsuits, or shoulder pads. I think the truth is, if you wait long enough, every fashion will come round again. So maybe we'll be seeing those low-hanging pants again one day. Ha! Unit 7, Recording 3 What were the weirdest fashions in history? <laughs> uh, some of the greatest excesses in the history of fashion, and I think most people would agree, took place in the European courts of the 18th century. First of all, there were the women's dresses. The panniers at the side of these dresses, which were kind of wire cages built underneath the skirt, meant that one of these court ladies would take up the space of maybe three men and would have had to walk sideways through most doors. Uh, the aristocrats who lived in these courts, who were, of course, only a tiny elite in society, they saw their clothes as a way of displaying their wealth. They dressed in a lavish way to show off their economic status, and, of course, their clothes showed that they didn't have to work or, or do anything practical. And then there were the vast powdered wigs worn by both men and women, though I do think some of the stories told about them are, in fact, exaggerated. I don't know, for example, if many people really had mice living in their wigs or if people really slept in a seated position because of their wigs. But the story of a wig with a model ship built into it is certainly a true one. That really did happen. What is rather strange is that when Americans and Europeans of this period traveled to Japan, they found the fashion among wealthy Japanese men for wearing their ponytail stuck to the top of their head, samurai style, very strange. They wrote about it in their diaries. It didn't seem to occur to them that their own preference for enormously tall wigs must have looked pretty weird, too. <laughs> right. And which was the most uncomfortable or, or harmful fashion in history? Mm, there are a lot of contenders for this title, mostly affecting women, of course, since one recurrent feature of fashion throughout history is the way it has made women physically weaker, even disabled in extreme cases, we could say, in order perhaps to make men feel stronger and more powerful. In America and Europe, I think we would have to point to the corset worn by women for so many centuries. These frequently restricted breathing, broke ribs, and even caused miscarriages. They really could be very dangerous garments. Uh, there was also the rather strange fashion of about a hundred years ago of wearing hobble skirts. 
Uh, these skirts mimic the styles worn by Japanese geishas, and they were so tight round the ankles that women could only walk with the tiniest steps. They apparently wore belts round their ankles to keep their steps short enough. And of course, there are similar examples in many cultures. Uh, the neck rings worn by Padung tribes women from childhood intended to lengthen their necks, which can also deform their shoulders, and of course the tradition of binding the feet of female children to keep them small and dainty, which survived in China until the beginning of the 20th century. And I guess many of the super high-heeled shoes that we see on catwalks today fall into this category. The history of fashion is full of incredibly uncomfortable, impractical garments in actual fact. What was the biggest moment of change in fashion history? I think I would point to two moments in modern history, really. Perhaps the most important one, for women in many countries at least, was at the end of the First World War. During the war, many women had been working in factories or driving carts and so forth, and they needed to wear more functional, less decorative clothes to reflect their new lifestyle. So the corsets were thrown away. Skirt lengths went up from the ankles to just below the knee, and long hair, which could get caught in factory machinery and so on, was cut short. Women's fashion essentially transformed from what it had been for centuries to what it is today. The other key moment, I think, was the 60s and the hippie movement. Up until that time, people had seen clothes as a reflection of their place in society. So a laborer would wear a different type of hat from a man who worked in an office, for example. But from the hippie era onwards, people began to see clothes much more as a way of expressing who they were, a way of expressing their individuality by growing their hair, wearing bright colors, or whatever they felt like. And that is something that has remained with us to a greater or lesser extent, I think. In your opinion, what are the worst fashions of recent times? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm spoilt for choice here. I can think of so many. In recent years, I would probably pick out hanging pants. You know, that charming fashion for young men, or mostly young men, to wear their jeans so low that you can see their undergarments. I mean, how's that going to look in 20 years' time, really? Um, another trend I hate is wearing big glasses frames without any lenses in them. Very pretentious in my view. Uh, what else? Meggings. Leggings for men. That is not a good look in my book. Oh, and another thing I have seen on the catwalks recently, which I really don't like, is the fashion for wearing mega high heels with ankle socks. Again, I don't think we'll look back on it in 10 years' time and think, wow, that was cool. But really, there are so many examples that I could go on and on. How long does it take on average for a fashion to be recycled? And why do some fashions keep coming back? Mm, it's generally reckoned that fashions make a comeback roughly every 20 years, that they're usually at their most outdated about 12 to 15 years after they were originally in. As to why, I don't know if I can answer that question. I would like to say that it's usually the most elegant and classical styles that get recycled, like those of the 50s and early 60s. And we definitely do see those styles coming back again and again. But some of the ugliest fashions also make a comeback. Platform shoes, for example, which seem to come back into fashion time and again. Or jumpsuits or shoulder pads. I think the truth is, if you wait long enough, every fashion will come around again. So maybe we'll be seeing those low-hanging pants again one day. Ha! Unit 7, Recording 4, 1. Am I pleased that we left? 2. I felt really sorry for Charlie when I saw him yesterday. 3. This flat is a mess. I do think you have a responsibility to help with the housework. Four. I'm absolutely exhausted. I really need to get some sleep. Five. I'm sorry. But the way Gina behaves does annoy me. Six. I know you think I don't like your cooking, but I do like it. Seven. 
Seven. I was definitely relieved when the day was over. Unit 7, recording 5. 1. Can you identify this common effect? That's right, it's wind. But have you ever wondered how these things happen? 2. Is it okay if I use your photocopier? I just need one copy. Three. It's over there, just by the coffee machine. Three. Henri obviously isn't happy with that decision. He hasn't said anything, but he's giving the referee a very dirty... Four. Die Hard 10. See it now at a cinema near you. Original... ...track available from all good record stores. Five. Well, this to me is the problem of modern-day politicians. They don't have real policies. Instead, they just give us bites. To me, they're treating the public like fools. I mean, what do they really think? Six. It's going to be the party of the year. It'll be fantastic. We've hired 20 Elton John alikes to serve the drinks. And that's not all. We've also got about 700... 7. Now, I know you're in love, but that's no reason to marry the girl when you've only known her for a few weeks. Before you leap, that's what they say. 8. It's a Wonderful Life, starring James Stewart, is still one of the most popular good movies of all time and is often shown around Christmas time. 9. Why not give us a call here on 94.5 FM chat radio and we're giving you the chance to <laughs> off about any subject you feel strongly about. Double eight three hundred is the number and our first caller is on the line. 10. Well, just look at that. An Olympic gold medal at the age of just 18. And she looks absolutely delighted, doesn't she? She must on top of the world as she waves to the crowd and then... 11. I think it's very important that all the employees in this company up to me. I am their boss, after all, and I think I deserve their respect. 12. Here on Chat Radio, and we're discussing today's news that the Prime Minister has resigned. Charles Lowe, what's your view on this? Well, to be honest, I have mixed about it. Obviously, I'm very sad on the one hand, but on the other hand, I think this is a great opportunity for us all. Unit 7, Recording 6. 1. Write down the name of a famous person who has a very good look-alike. Two. Write yes if you think most politicians in your country speak in sound bites, and no if you think that is unfair. Three. Write down anything that would help to make you feel on top of the world. Four. Write down the name of someone you really look up to. Five. Write yes if you have a tendency to sound off about things you don't like, and no if you usually keep quiet. Six. Write down the name of a film soundtrack you really like. Seven. 
Write down the name of a famous person you have very mixed feelings about. Eight. Write good if you think you are good at giving people dirty looks and not good if you're not. Unit 7, Recording 7. 1. I love hip hop music. I think it's such a cool form of music to dance to, just to listen to on your own. Um, the beat alone is enough, but if, if you listen to the lyrics, they're so, sometimes they can be so poetic and people criticize it for having swear words, but so many, so many rappers and rap groups don't even use swear words. And I think they're verbal geniuses and um, also just really enjoyable to listen to. Two. Now, the thing is, right, is that you pay a lot of money to go and watch football, right? And we're looking at one of the best leagues in the world. These players are paid a fortune. We pay money to go and watch them. And then you get some idiot referee comes along, doesn't know what offside is. Give goals to teams that haven't scored. And sometimes it goes over the line by at least two or three yards. And because it's at a big club, they don't give the goal. It's disgusting. I mean, I'd, I'd think they bribed half of them, to be honest. I mean, now they say it's all, no corruption in, in the English game. I think it's a load of old nonsense. Three. There's one thing that really gets on my nerves. It's this sort of worship of the monarchy and royalty in this country. I fail to understand why there aren't, you know, riots on the streets when you see the amount of money and privilege and assets that these people have. And it seems very odd to me that it's the poorest people very often who are the ones that idolise him the most. There's something fundamentally immoral about you know, people living with this amount of wealth and privilege when there are people who can't afford to heat their homes, who can't afford a home even. Um, and it makes me absolutely furious. It really does. Four. Last week, I was reminded of how much I absolutely love theatre. When it is good, there is nothing like it. And fortunately, last week, I saw two productions that just took my breath away. They were absolutely spectacular. It's a type of magic because it's in that room, in that auditorium for only those people who are there. It's, that's what separates it from film and television. Is it's like its own well-kept secret. And it's just magic. Five. There's something I can't stand that everyone else seems to love these days, and it's social media. I don't know what it is. I feel a bit left behind, and I feel a bit grumpy, and it's not a very nice feeling, but I can't be doing with people telling me that they've just had this fantastic egg for breakfast, or they, they've been shopping and they've just found this nice T-shirt, and, and they want to share that with all their friends on, on Facebook. I think there's a, there's a way of using it, these things so that you can keep in touch with friends, but don't tell me about some rubbish that's just happened to you just because you've got nothing else to do, honestly. Unit 7, Recording 8. 1. Welcome to my review channel. My name's Greg, and don't forget to click on the thumbs up icon if you like my video reviews. Today, I'm going to be reviewing the new E Series 9000 from Fabtran. I've had it for about a week now, and I just want to tell you a few things about it and give you my opinion. Now, amazingly enough, you don't need to use a remote to operate this. You just need to wave your hand and use gestures to change the channel, the volume, and that kind of thing. It's a great feature, but to be perfectly honest, I don't use it. I mean, imagine if someone walked into the room while I was waving at my TV. They'd think I was crazy. So I just use the normal remote and I'm glad to say that they include one of those with the package. And here it is. Just looks like a normal remote, really. Lots of buttons that you'll never use. Anyway, let's talk about the quality of the image and the sound. Those are the really important things, right? I'm going to turn it on and all being well, it's going to work. There. Now, to tell the truth, the sound quality is not the best in the world. But it's not the worst either, and actually, I think that given the price, 
it's fine. The image quality, however, is fantastic. The colours are vibrant and, quite frankly, it's got one of the best pictures I've ever seen, certainly at this price point. If you look on the back, you can see the connections. There are one, four HDMI connections, uh, two USB connections, two ports for DVD. Two. Hi, guys. Uh, my name's Monica, and I just wanted to show you my new red circles that I bought online. They arrived today in the post, and thank goodness I kept the receipt, because they are going straight back for a refund. I really don't like them. There are a couple of reasons. Firstly, much to my surprise, the pockets are tiny. I mean, they're so shallow that I can't even fit my fingers in them, let alone my keys and my phone, so that's really disappointing. And I wouldn't want to put my hands in the pockets anyway because they'd get covered in blue dye. <laughs> yes, the worst thing about these is that the colour in the denim comes off really easily. They call it raw denim. Apparently it's quite trendy, but I really don't like it. And it's a good job I didn't sit down on my white sofa because it would now be a blue sofa. Uh, as you can see, they've got buttons rather than a zip at the front, which I'm not very keen on. And to make matters worse, one of the buttons fell off while I was trying them on for the first time. Funnily enough, my friend bought exactly the same pair of jeans and one of her buttons fell off too. To my utter astonishment, however, she likes her jeans and doesn't seem to care that the dye comes off. Well... She's not going to sit on my sofa, that's all I can say. Unit 8, Recording 1 1 My sister really drives me mad because she won't just have, you know, a normal conversation about something if we disagree. She'll just go off into a corner and sulk like a four-year-old and it will last for ages. She can go on like this, she can not talk to me, she won't pick up the phone. It drives me mad, I'd rather just you know, come out with it, say what the problem is and move on. You can't have a normal argument and get over it like most people. She doesn't get over it. It goes on and on and on. Sometimes for months she'll be quiet and not say anything. Two. I share a dorm room with um, my friend, Laura, and she's she's really she's really a lot of fun and she's really funny and we always have a good laugh about stuff happening at school the only problem is that she never stops talking. I mean, like, I, I, lo I love talking as well, but after a long day of classes and then I also have a part-time job, I sometimes just want to come into the dorm room and, and relax and or do work or just chill out on my own and listen to music or something. And she's just always there and she always wants to tell me everything she's done in the day, uh, which I'm glad to hear sometimes, but not all the time, just every single thing she's done that day, every single you know, thing she ate. It's just like, I don't need to know every single detail going on in her life. Um, and I I hate to say this, but I, I just really wish she would shut up sometimes, just at least for a few minutes so I can think. Three. The worst thing about Tony, my ex-flatmate, was his moods. Uh, he just would swing from one extreme to the other. So for one day he'd be full of jokes and laughs and conversations and I'd think, oh, that's fantastic living with Tony. And then literally the next day I'd come home and he'd just he'd be monosyllabic or, or not even speak to me and he'd have a face like thunder. Um, and I felt like maybe I've done something wrong. Have I offended him? Have I, you know, is my room too messy or something? And I just, oh, I couldn't be doing with it. You never knew where you stood with him. Four. I think what really annoys me about my boyfriend is that he's incredibly opinionated and um, takes the moral high ground on most things. Um, he has been described by people as a bit of a know-it-all. Um, he's got better latterly at sort of pretending to listen and take on board um, other people's opinions, but you just know that deep down that he believes that he is the, the word of authority and um, I find that intensely annoying, actually. Five. One massive problem with my ex-husband was that he was tidy, but I mean to the point of fanatically tidy. You know, he would pick up um, anything. If it had been lying on the floor for two seconds, there'd be a big, oh, and a tut, and then it would be folded with military precision and then put in the correct place instantly. So I just couldn't leave 
anything, not even for five minutes if I was going into the shower, left a towel on the floor. Everything was then just oh, sighing and groaning about it and then putting it away, but putting it away within two seconds and it has to go back in the right place. It cannot go in the wrong place. It must go in this place, which is specifically for the white towels. Oh, it drove me crazy. Unit 8, Recording 2. Peter, did you used to be in the army? Yes, in my time, it, you had to do national service when you were 18 years and it was compulsory. So you had no choice. So how did you find it? Well, I remember at the time I was really looking forward to it. It was uh, an opportunity to go abroad and uh, live in other countries. And it was quite a shock when I got in. What, what were you looking forward to? I can't imagine anything worse than being in the army. Well, it was... I don't know, it was, it was exciting, it was that boy thing and, and shooting a rifle and, and going abroad. Yes, I remember I was really looking forward to it. The, the first thing they, they put in my hand was an iron and, and they showed us how to iron a shirt, <laughs> uh, which wasn't what I wanted to join the army for because I'd never ironed a shirt in my life. <laughs> and then the next thing they did was they, they showed us how to sew a button on a shirt and how to darn a hole in a sock. I think it was about six weeks before I was even allowed to get my hands on a rifle at all. Yeah. What about you, Liz? When did you leave home? Oh, I, well, I went to boarding school when I was 11. Oh. Um, I'd had a wonderfully free life growing up in the country in Australia. And suddenly, at the age of 11, my parents decided that they wanted me to go to a school in the city. What about you? Um, well, I started doing some au pairing when I was 18. Um, I'd done French A-level, so my French was relatively good, but um, still spe you know, speaking in conversation and living in the French language for a month was very daunting. Was it different to how you imagined it was going to be? Um, I can't remember now what I imagined, but I mean, we had some fantastic times. The weather was gorgeous every single day. I would go down to the beach every day. Um, the kids were a good age, so they, they could go off and play. Um, but it wasn't all kind of playing on the Lame beach. sailing. Yeah. <laughs> the parents really wanted them to learn English whilst I was there, so one of my roles was to teach them English, um, which for an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old in their summer holiday was not what they wanted to do at all. So we had quite a lot of battles trying to get them to sit down at that dining room table um, and do their work. But what was it like? What was it like actually just living in a, you know, a place that you hadn't been to before, with a family that you weren't, that you didn't know, mm. and living under somebody else's rules. It, difficult being an au pair. You're told what to do. You're there. You're getting paid. You're living in their house, and you have to abide by their rules. I don't like being told what to do, and to be told to go and put on the milk, to sweep the floor, to put the washing out. I find quite hard work. But after a couple of weeks, you get to know the routine, so you start doing those kind of things yourself without having to be told. Mm. Um, but I did have moments when I just kind of stormed up to my room and shut the door because at 18 I'm, I was still quite young, I was still quite inexperienced and I found it quite difficult to deal with that. Well I um, suppose that's something that you had to do as well, didn't you? Live under, under the rules of the army at 18, that was Yes, that's right, yes. The, the, the discipline was very, very hard but um, there's, there's one, another story that I remember about uh, being in the army because uh, suddenly we found ourselves in a, in a long hut with about 30 beds, uh, with a, a, a short space between each bed. And from all walks of life, we came from everywhere, and, and the man opposite me, he was a, a huge man, and he was one of these people that you avoided eye contact with, because uh, if you so much as glanced at him, he looked as if he was ready to, uh, to attack you. And he had this thick Elvis Presley style hairstyle, and uh, on the second day, we were marched to the barber shop to have uh, a haircut, and they just cut the whole lot off. <laughs> and I remember him standing outside afterwards, and he was—he looked like a, an overgrown schoolboy, and he was crying. There was tears were running down his cheek, and he was quiet for about two days. And then after that, he, you couldn't have met a nicer person. He, he did everything, he joined in everything, and he was, uh, he was really completely different. 
So it's just his hair him. gave him an ego. Perhaps sure. that was his way of coping in an alien environment. Could be. As well. yeah, How could do you be. feel about having your head shaved then? I mean, did you... Well, they didn't actually shave it. They just they gave us what, what was known in those days as a short back and sides. But, but did you feel like you lost your individuality? Uh, yeah, because that was the whole idea to make to make you work as as one unit. Mm. So that if they if they shouted jump, uh, then thirty men jumped at the same time because uh, that was the whole objective to um, uh, to discipline people and and to make it you an, an effective force. How did that affect you? How you know, how do you feel about it now, looking back? Um, well, at the time, it it. Uh, it was a bit scary, but uh, looking back now, I think it was it was a good time. Mm, how boarding school affected me? Well, I said earlier it made me a really independent person. Yeah. And at the time, at the time, I hated it. I hated the rules. I hated the regulations. But it did it did as I said give me independence. But it also made me quite a conscientious person because I got used to studying. Mm -hmm. And I think as a result of that, I developed into a very different person at the end of the day than I would have done had I stayed in Australia and you know, living my free life in the countryside. So I suppose looking back, looking back, I'm very grateful that my parents made that decision to send me away, but certainly I didn't feel that when I was 11. Unit 8, Recording 3, 1. I'll just take your coat for you. Two. I was so annoyed I just tore up the letter and walked out. Three. I'm just looking, thank you. Four. The weather was just perfect for my birthday party. Five. These shoes are just what I need. Six. I'll just be a few minutes and then we can go. Seven. Look, I've just found that receipt you were looking for. Eight. Lunch is just a sandwich. I hope that's OK. Nine. Would you mind just holding this for me, please? Ten. I've just got enough money to pay. Unit 8, Recording 4. 1. Annie loves her new job. I think it's given her a sense of security at last. 2. He's got this big fear of rejection. I think that's why he won't apply for promotion. 3. You know Hannah. She's always had a love of adventure. Four. Don't take any notice of me. You know I've got a tendency to worry about the slightest thing. Five. I get so fed up of Al. Why does he feel a constant need to show off? Six. I think my mother always felt an enormous desire to please other people. Seven. For someone so talented, Ben's got an amazing lack of ambition. Eight. One thing you can say about Martin, he's got a great sense of fun. Nine. Sorry if I keep asking you the same thing again and again. I've just got this need for reassurance. Ten. You can't keep secrets from Alex. She's got this strange ability to read your mind. Eleven. Oh, I'm so glad I've done all that filing. It's given me a weird sense of achievement. Twelve. It's no good talking to Andy. He's got a complete inability to see other people's point of view. Unit 8, Recording 5. 1. A sense of security. 2. A fear of rejection. 
Three. A love of adventure. Four. A tendency to worry. Five. A need to show off. Six. A desire to please. Seven. A lack of ambition. Eight. A sense of fun. Nine. A need for reassurance. Ten. An ability to read your mind. Eleven. A sense of achievement. Twelve. An inability to see other people's point of view. Unit nine, recording one. And no doubt we'll be hearing more about that in the future. Now, while most of us are increasingly feeling like we're drowning in a sea of data, there are some people who can't get enough of it. Particularly as it applies to their own lives, our reporter Benta McDonald went to meet some of the people who are living by numbers. How much time do I spend on Facebook? Does coffee really help me to concentrate? Where did I go, and what did I do on Sunday five weeks ago? Most of us rely on gut instinct or vague memories to answer questions like these, but there is a growing band of people who are not content to guess. They want cold, hard data, and they wouldn't dream of making a decision without it. And modern technology is making it easier and easier for them to collect and analyse huge quantities of data, particularly with the help of that small personal computer called a mobile phone, sometimes called the quantified self movement, sometimes called self tracking. This trend is rapidly changing what we know and how we live, and it's coming to all of us very soon, according to self-tracking addict Kevin Breyer. Measuring stuff isn't new, you know. We're used to measuring our height, our weight, our temperature when we're sick, and stuff like that. But the self-tracking movement is taking it all to a whole new level, and it's not just about health and fitness. That's old school stuff now, you know. Serious self trackers are tracking more and more complex stuff, like their sleep patterns, how much time they spend daydreaming, how their mood changes over time, what affects their brainwave patterns, you know, that sort of thing. And more and more people are doing it. You know, it's becoming mainstream. So, what do you track, and how do you track it? Well, for example, I have a special fork that tracks how many bites I've taken. How many bites? Yeah, like eighty is supposed to be the optimum amount to feel full. So my fork tells me if I've had more than eighty bites in a day, and it tells me how long it takes me to eat my meal, and it sends all that information straight to my computer so that I can see on a graph if I'm eating too fast or too much. Wow, what else? Well. I wear a tiny camera everywhere I go, which takes a photo every thirty seconds and then stores the photos in the cloud. So anytime I want to, I can look up a date, say fifteenth July last year, and actually see what I was doing, where I went, what I ate, who I talked to, that sort of thing. And then I can cross-reference it to my mood database and see how I felt. And over time, I get a picture of what makes me happy and what makes my life better, and I can put that knowledge into action. Knowledge is power, you know, and knowledge comes from information.、Hmm. And Kevin is a relative lightweight compared to some others in the quantified self movement. Lucy Granger, for example, keeps a popular blog where she shares data on over fifty different aspects of her life that she tracks. Including caffeine intake, sleep patterns, and time spent on social media, she even keeps a database of all the thoughts and ideas that she has, each one dated and tagged, so that she knows not only what she was doing five years ago, but also what she was thinking about. But the real question is, perhaps, with all this data and analysis, when do you have time to actually live?
Unit 9, Recording 2. Following on from Benton MacDonald's report, we have two guests in the studio to debate the merits of the quantified self movement. Roger Acton, a journalist, blogger, author, and committed self tracker, and Charlotte Marling, artist, winner of the Turner Prize, and vociferous anti self tracker. Uh, Charlotte, why are you so against tracking? Isn't it true that the more we know about ourselves, the better? Yes, of course it is, but you have to learn useful things about yourself. The trouble with self tracking is that you learn nothing useful about yourself and you waste a lot of time. I mean, apart from the money spent on buying tracking devices and the time spent collecting the data, you then have to spend hours looking at the data in order to learn anything. And what do you learn? That you've spent three hours daydreaming or you've had 90 mouthfuls of food. How does that help? I think it helps a lot, actually. If I find out that I'm eating 90 mouthfuls of food, then probably I'm overeating, and that's not healthy. And if I'm spending three hours a day daydreaming, then I'm not being very efficient, so I need to change. That's exactly the problem, you see. People like Roger believe that everything can be reduced to numbers. It's just a typical male obsession with data, like collecting information on football teams. Actually, a lot of self trackers are female. The point is. And I don't like football. The point is, if I spend all my time collecting and analysing data, then when am I supposed to actually live? You can't measure the important things, like. How sunshine makes you feel,、mm. or how important your friends are. Self tracking doesn't stop you living, it helps you to live better. I'll give you an example. Through self tracking, I discovered that I'm mentally at my best in the afternoon between two and five. So I make sure that I do all my boring paperwork in the morning and keep the afternoon clear for important work. That's made me much more efficient. It's made me a better person. What would make you a better person is to spend more time with your friends and family and not with your spreadsheets and databases. Do you spend too much time tracking and not enough time enjoying life, Roger? No, not at all. Self tracking is a social movement. There are quantified self meetings in over a hundred cities all over the world. People come together to talk, to share experiences. <laughs> They come together to compare spreadsheets, you mean? No, Charlotte, you're wrong. The trouble with you is that you're afraid of what you might learn. <laughs> I am not. You're afraid that you may learn how unhappy or unhealthy or inefficient you are. You're afraid of the truth. Why not try self tracking, Charlotte? Why not give it a go? Because it's a waste of time and money. That's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. And I don't need numbers to tell me how I feel. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure we'll be coming back to this debate in the future, but in the meantime, it's It's time for a look at the local weather. Unit 9, recording 3. 1. Can I get past, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Are my bags in the way? I'll put them up in the locker. 2. Oh dear, I think we're lost. What do you think we should do? Why don't you stop and ask the way? 3. What do you think we should buy Sophie for her birthday? How about a doll? No way! She's 14 years old. She's way too old for dolls. Four. Were the staff nice at the hotel? Oh, yes. They really went out of their way to make us feel at home. Five. Okay, we'll drive to the restaurant. Do you know the way? I'm not sure I remember it. You'd better lead the way and we'll follow behind. Six. When will the new cinema complex open? I expect the work to be underway by the beginning of next month. Seven. How many children does Geraldine have now? Three. And there's another one on the way. Eight. Is this how I put the ink cartridge in? No, you've got it the wrong way round. Here, let me do it. Unit 9, recording 4. 1. My invention is something that I often imagine because, like a lot of people, I quite often mislay everyday objects and I spend a lot of time hunting for them, especially when I'm just about to leave the house, which, of course, often makes me late. It could be my keys or my wallet or my bag or my shoes or my phone. Except there's one difference with my phone because I can call it and find it because it rings. 
So my invention would be a small device about the size of a button, say, which you could attach to those everyday objects that you often lose and which would be linked to your phone so that you could call them too if you lost them. You could call your keys or call your shoes and they would ring and you'd be able to find them in seconds instead of spending hours searching for them. Two. In an age when society has so many problems with obesity and stress, I think the idea of having a play area for adults makes perfect sense. It would be much more convenient and fun than going to the gym. There would be climbing walls and adult-sized swings and slides, all of which would be really good for building up muscles, using up calories and getting rid of stress. And you could have trampolines, which again are fantastic exercise and really good fun. I think it would appeal to people of all ages, from teenagers to pensioners, men and women. And more importantly, people wouldn't have to make a special decision to go there and change into special clothes like they have to do when they go to the gym. They could just use it whenever they felt like it, just for five or ten minutes as they were passing. It would be a great way of socialising too, much healthier than meeting people for a meal or film, and much more fun too. I think they would soon become hugely popular and spring up in parks everywhere. Three. This is a really simple idea, but I think it would make public transport much more user-friendly and offer a greatly improved service. Time and time again it happens that you see your bus and start running for it, but just as you get there, the doors close and it pulls away. But I'm sure that most drivers would wait for you if they knew you were only a few seconds away. How many times have you wished you could just communicate with the driver and let him know how close you are? So basically, the idea would be that for a certain fee, you could buy a special bus pass and there would be a chip built in that would connect with the bus and maybe beep or make a light flash or whatever and let the bus driver know that you were running along the road and only a few seconds away so that he could wait for you. You would never have the frustration of missing your bus in the morning and being late for work or college ever again. I really think this could make a lot of money for bus companies and make passengers' lives a lot easier. Four. My invention is very simple and very practical, but I think there could be a real market for it. It would be an app that made use of the camera on your phone to photograph and take the exact measurement of things. Its main use would be when you go shopping. If you're buying a new cupboard, for example, you could take a photograph of the space where you want to put it with its measurements. Then when you get to the shop, you could take a photograph of the cupboard and you would know straight away whether or not it would fit. Or if you were shopping for clothes, you wouldn't need to spend hours trying on different sizes because, <laughs> let's face it, sizes vary dramatically from shop to shop. Uh, you could just photograph the garment, then compare it with your measurements, which you would keep stored on the app, and then just try on the garments that were the right size, saving yourself a lot of time. As I say, I think there's potentially a real market for this. I believe it could catch on in the same way sat-navs have. If you think about it, it's potentially just as useful. Five. Whenever polls are done to find out what everyday behaviour people find most annoying, tailgating on motorways, people driving too close to the back of your car in the fast lane, is one of the most common issues. It's nearly always done by people who are breaking the speed limit, and it's very dangerous. Accidents are much more likely to be fatal if the two vehicles are close together, and it's also very distracting and stressful for the person being tailgated. But the problem is that there's no way of communicating with the tailgater to tell him, and it usually is a him, to back off. You can't flash your lights at him or anything like that. So my invention would be very simple. It would be a sign that lights up on the back of the car and says, keep your distance, with maybe a sad face that changes to a smiley face when they go back to the correct distance. It would make motorways much safer places and really reduce the stress for most people who just want to drive in a safe way and stick to the speed limit.
Unit 9, Recording 5. 1. Hello, software support. Have you got a service code? Yes, it's CLX8D9Y. OK. Is that Ms Rains? That's right. How can I help you? Well, I'm having some problems with the laptop I bought from your company. What kind of problems are you having? I've only had it a couple of days, but it won't connect to the internet. Can you describe the problem to me? Yeah, well, some of the time it's OK, but most of the time the computer just can't find my wireless router. But when it does and I type in the password, it throws up an error message. And is your router plugged in and turned on all the time? Yes, it is. We've got two other computers in the house and they're both connected the whole time, no problem. Hmm. Are you having any other problems with the computer? Well, it's running very slowly and occasionally the screen freezes and I have to reboot. When does it freeze? Mm, for example, if I try to cut and paste something. OK. Have you run the system scan? No, I haven't. How do I do that? I'll talk you through it, but first I need to check. Have you backed up all your files to an external hard disk? Yes, I have. OK. Is your computer on now and are you next to it? Yes. Then let's start by closing down any programs that are open. OK, I'll do that now. Two. Hi, can I help you? Yes, I'm having some problems with my new phone and I wondered if you could help me. Have you got your receipt? I didn't print out a hard copy, but I've got the confirmation email here. If you scroll down to the bottom, you can see it. OK, that's fine. If you tell me what the problem is, then I'll see what I can do. Well, the phone can't seem to find a signal. It can't find a mobile signal. That's right, so I can't make or receive calls. It's pretty useless as a phone, really. Have you done anything to the phone? You know, dropped it or installed any illegal software or anything? No, I haven't. When I first got the phone, I had to update the operating system and then it asked me to set up an account and create a new password, which I did. But now it just doesn't work, basically. Does the phone crash sometimes? It's crashed a couple of times. Have you reset the phone? How do you do that? You turn it off and remove the battery. That usually solves the problem. I haven't tried that. Shall I give it a go now? Sure, do that and see if it helps. We'll give it a few minutes and then if it... Three. That's £2.95 altogether, please. I've only got a 20, I'm afraid. That's fine. Sorry. The drawer's jammed. <sighs> I can't open it. I'll have to call my manager. Mr Walsh! Yes, Lucy? The cash till seems to have broken again. I think the drawer's jammed this time. OK, let me have a look at it. There's a latch under the drawer, and if you release the latch, then it should open. Great, thanks. Oh, what do I do now? The screen is blank. Nothing's happening. I'm so sorry, madam. This till is very temperamental. That's OK. Lucy, press clear. Is anything happening? Nothing. It's dead as a dodo. Hold down clear and press delete. It's a process of trial and error sometimes. Still nothing. OK, turn it off and turn it on again. Oh, that's better. You'll have to scan everything again. OK. Sorry, madam. Could I rescan the items in your bag? Sure. Here you are. Unit 10, recording 1. A. This is the true story of an undercover police officer who fell in love with the people he was supposed to be spying on. Names and some details have been changed to protect the identity of those involved. John Kay grew up on the outskirts of Leeds. The son of a well-respected transport police officer, he followed his father's example and joined the police force at the age of 21. You'll never be rich, his father told him, but you'll be proud of what you've done. John quickly impressed his superior officers and he began working as an undercover officer, helping to arrest drug dealers. He got married and had two children, 
but his taste for adventure meant that he was an unconventional father. He also loved going to punk rock concerts and was an expert climber, which meant that he was frequently away on climbing trips all over Europe. Because he was good at his job, John was asked to join a new police unit, part of whose role was to spy on environmental groups. He was given training and a new identity. He grew his hair long, got his ears pierced, and had several tattoos done. He learned to be vegan, and when he was ready, started to infiltrate the activists. It wasn't easy to be accepted at first, but John's experience as a climber proved very useful, as the group frequently climbed towers and tall buildings in order to hang protest banners. Slowly, the other protesters came to know and trust John. They nicknamed him Johnny Cash because, unlike many of them, John always seemed to have as much money as he needed. For his part, John was sympathetic to the environmental movement and what it was trying to achieve. Many of its members were people much like him, and he justified his job by telling himself that he wasn't harming the protesters by spying on them, quite the opposite, in fact. By providing the police with intelligence on their activities, he was helping to protect them. He felt that if the police knew what the activists were planning, they could make sure no one got hurt. It wasn't long, however, before John began to question this view and wonder which side was right. Unit 10, Recording 2 in Edinburgh in 2004, John joined thousands of other activists at a protest. To protect his identity, local police were not told that an undercover agent was present. As the protesters pushed forward, John, who was at the front, found himself under attack. He was hit by a police baton. One of his fellow protesters jumped in to protect him and was also hit. Battered and bruised, John left the protest in a state of confusion. The intelligence he was providing was supposed to prevent violence happening, but instead he had been attacked by his police colleagues and protected by the people he was spying on. It wasn't easy to understand. It was also becoming increasingly difficult for John to reconcile his two lives, Every few weeks, he returned home to see his wife and children, but he was a different man from the one his wife had known. He grew vegetables in the garden, refused to eat meat, and eventually he and his wife became estranged. They stayed together for the children, but their marriage was effectively over. Around this time, John also fell in love with a woman in the movement. They became inseparable, and spent as much time together as possible. Being in love, John found it difficult to lie to her about his true identity. Despite this, his career was going well, and his senior officers were pleased with the intelligence he was giving them. The final straw, however, came in 2009, when John was asked to secretly record a group who were planning to shut down an oil refinery. John was torn because many of the protesters were his friends and he knew that his evidence might send some of them to jail. Reluctantly, he agreed. On the day that the activists planned to shut down the refinery, the police burst into the hall where the group was staying and arrested everyone, over 100 people. They eventually charged just 19 of them and, to his amazement, John was one of them. When he asked his senior officers why he was being charged, they said that it was out of their hands. John began to suspect he was being set up. He knew that he couldn't go to court and be charged because his identity was false and he didn't really exist. He would be found out. He also knew that if the police dropped the charges against him, his friends in the movement would become suspicious. For the first time, John had no idea what he should do. Unit 10, Recording 3
One week before John was due to go to court, all charges against him were dropped. He had hoped that the charges against the other 18 would also be dropped, but this didn't happen, and John was now under suspicion from both sides. The police worried that he was too deeply involved with the activists, and the activists worried that he was linked with the police. Everything quickly fell apart for John. He was told by his superior officers that his mission was ending and that he had to get out as soon as he could. When he asked what his next job would be, he was told that there was no work for him in the police force. Having spent many years undercover, he had no relevant skills for the modern workplace, and he was no longer trusted by his fellow officers. John resigned. His father's words, that he would be proud of what he had done, seemed to ring hollow in his ears. Eventually he decided that he had no option but to return to his life as an eco-activist. However, his girlfriend found his passport in his real name and the truth about his identity quickly came out. She was heartbroken, and his friends in the protest movement turned against him. With all his bridges burned and with no one to help him, he fled to Canada and contemplated ending it all. One day, however, an old friend from the protest movement got in touch and offered him a chance for redemption. He asked John if he would return to the UK and help defend six of those who had been arrested trying to close down the oil refinery. John said yes, and as a result of his help, charges against the six were dropped and the convictions of 15 other activists were overturned. The fallout from the case made headlines around the world. The government ordered an independent inquiry into the spying operation, and John's ex-girlfriend sued the police for the distress they had caused her in allowing and encouraging one of their officers to form a relationship with her. Soon after, John himself decided to sue the police for failing to protect him from falling in love with the people he was sent to spy on. Unit 10, Recording 4 Have you finished with the paper? Hang on, I'm just reading an article about lie detectors. Oh, yes, that one. I started reading it this morning, but I didn't finish it. Is it interesting? Yes. Apparently, you can tell someone's lying because they can't help blushing. Do they realise they are? No, I don't think so. Uh, tell me... Do you ever blush when you talk to me? No, of course I don't. That's because I never lie to you. Is that true? Of course it is. We never lie to each other, right? So why are you blushing now, then? Unit 10, Recording 5. A. Right, so I'm going to start with skills and abilities that I have. And you may not know this about me, but I am a qualified nail technician. So I can put on false nails and I can also do manicures and pedicures and all of that. Mm. That's my first one. And um, my yeah. second one is that I am an accomplished baker. I've won prizes for my cakes. I do cupcakes. I do all sorts of baking. That's my second one. And my third one is that I'm an extremely fast touch typer. And I learnt at school and I kept it up for secretarial work. And my next skill and ability that I have is I can make jewellery. I make a lot of my own jewellery and I can string beads onto necklaces and so on. And I, um, I also learnt accountancy and bookkeeping and passed an exam in that. And how many have I done? One, two, three, four, five. And my final skill and ability that I have is I can train dogs. And I've trained quite a few, not just my own, but my friends. Um, so there you go. That's, that's all my skills. Which ones are lies? Oh, my goodness. You um, can have some questions. Right. So with, with the um, bookkeeping... Mm -hmm. What exam did you say you took for that? I sat a GCSE in accounts. I see. Okay. 
Okay, right. Question two. Um, these dogs. What were you actually training them to do? They can. Well, I can teach them to sit, walk, heel, and they can fetch, and they can lie down, and if they're like retrievers, they're very, very good at stuff like that. So I'm very good at retrievers. That's your speciality. Specifically, right. Can I just ask you if you were going to sit and do my nails? What would you? What would be the first thing that you would do? Right. Well, it would depend if you wanted false nails or you wanted just a manicure. Oh no, I'd quite want, like some. Can you do acrylic? Yeah. Uh, no, I can't. I can do fiberglass. Oh, fiberglass. Yeah. So right. we'd start by buffing yes. the nails. Right. Uh, that would be the first thing I'd do. Yeah. And then you use a resin, which is like a glue. Mm. So you say you're an accomplished baker. Yep. And did you train for this? And if so, which college did you go to? Well, in truth, I didn't train for it formally, but my mother was a supreme baker, and she won ah. loads of competitions. So she trained me up. I see. For about a year. Okay, that's four questions. You've only got one question left. Who is going to ask me something? Um, I was wondering about the touch typing. What do you know? How many words you do per minute? Forty-five. Forty-five words per minute. Yep. That's your lot. Any ideas? So what do you think, guys? Mm, tricky. Some, she was very convincing I, about nails, I have to say, wasn't she? And also convincing about the uh, typing. Yeah, I was There less, was no hesitation no, on the Dogs, I was less me. convinced. I was a bit wishy-washy. What do you mm. think? I agree with that, and I thought the, um, the making jewellery was slightly wishy-washy. Yeah. Right. What do you think? She, and, so, and the baking. She's far too thin she to be bake. an accomplished baker. Mm, right. So... Dog, we reckon dogs is in like. Do we? Do we think? Are that? you going for that? Mm, Are I don't know. That? No. Mm. Jewelry then? I I don't I didn't I didn't buy the jewelry. Or I didn't buy the pink. jewelry. So that's okay, jewelry. That, that's ju it. Jewelry, jewelry is one, one thing. The dogs. I was. I wasn't convinced that she's she's a no, dog trainer. I would say bookkeeper. Maybe. What and is the other okay. lie? Mm. Jewelry dogs. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to go with okay. that. Mm. Okay. Shall I tell you how many mm. you've got right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've got two rights. Oh, not bad. What are they? There's still a lie there. So I didn't train dogs. Yes. I don't know how to do that at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't make jewellery. No. Okay. So, But I did take a GCSE in accounting. Right. Mm. Nails. It's the nails then. No, the nails. Was, well, no. Do you not no, think? she... she No, No, because it and, takes more than an hour to do that. Does, does it? it? Mm. Oh. Mm. She sounded pretty convincing to me. Come on, you got one left. What, what were the Go other for one. things? You've got baking, yeah. touch typist, nail technician. Mm. Mm. Oh, I'll go for nails if you think. That's, uh, you know more than me. She sounded pretty convincing yeah. to me, but if you're sure. Is that what you're going for? I am a trained nail technician. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't won awards for baking cakes or anything. No, no, no. Yeah, you see, I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't train. <laughs> B. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what I did last weekend. Um, my wife and I went up to Newcastle for for a 24-hour visit, so it was pretty pretty quick. But we got on the train at about nine o'clock, and uh, had a very good journey up there. And uh, we went to stay in this hotel and. Um, got chatting to the receptionist and she said it was a bit of a quiet night so she upgraded us to the honeymoon suite which was frankly gorgeous um, we went out to um, have a look at Time of Festival just outside Newcastle there's this fantastic music festival going on um, the pounds were pretty good but really what I liked most was the ice cream on sale there they had this little authentic old fashioned ice cream seller um, selling ice creams for one pound which frankly you don't see very often these days um, that evening we had a huge meal, a really lovely, lovely meal in a, in a restaurant um, and uh, and then uh, got the train home the next day. The trouble with the train home was that typically there were delays, there were some uh, I don't know, problems with the signalling or something and we ended up having a, a four-hour journey back to London, so a bit of a shame at the end there. Any ideas? Okay, I thought I was so... very subtle myself. Yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. Okay. Um... So what were your top three bands at the music festival? Um, well, believe it or not, there was a band called Aswad, uh, which you may have uh, may remember. They're quite old. Um, the other band I really liked were the um, 
They were called The Calling, I believe, but they're a local local band, kind of a funk outfit. They were they were pretty good. Um, I can't really remember the other names of the the bands, but they there were some very good ones. There was a um a kind of uh, sort of uh, Caribbean sounding band which I which I really liked. Great. Okay. Um, what about the name of the restaurant? The name of the restaurant was called the Bahulish, and it was a sort of it was very dark, very trendy. But I'm I'm. People are there telling us that that's where all the footballers go to eat. So we felt quite um quite posh, but I, that it was a very very nice meal. Okay. Um, and uh, how would you describe the uh, the bathroom in the honeymoon suite? Opulent. Um, they, they were sort of gold taps, and it wasn't so much as a bath; it was more like a jacuzzi. It was uh, it was absolutely gorgeous. I could very much get used to that. And uh, how long was your journey to Newcastle? Up there, two hours, 20 minutes. To come back, four hours. Okay. Hmm. Um, I don't, I don't believe you went to this music festival. Rumbled. Yeah, That's we were I'm... actually on the outside of it only. And, um, but I, someone, yes, no, yes. I knew I was on, I was stuck there when you asked me the names of the bands. Okay. Good work, good yeah. work. Yeah, and then, um. I don't believe you were upgraded to that honeymoon suite. Ah, oh, again, rumbled. I can't believe it. Got you again. Uh, and you mentioned that ice cream. I, I, I just, it didn't sound convincing when you were talking about it. That's a clean sweep. You got me. It's a fair cop. I'm wow. a terrible liar. I'm obviously a very honest person. What can I say? I thought I thought it was really subtle, but I'm, I'm really happy that I won. And, <sighs> wow. That's, oh, uh, gutted. Yeah. Copyright Pearson Education Limited, 2014.